Parliament, Honorable Shandana Kulzer Khan, Member of the National Assembly of Pakistan and the Chairperson of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, Honorable Dr. Zainab Gimba, Member of the National Assembly of Nigeria and Chairperson of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, Africa Region, Representative Honor Honorable Veronica Cady Sasai, Member of Parliament of Sierra Leone and the CWP representative for the West Africa region. Honorable Murray Wenger, Chief Whip of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. Members of the provincial legislatures, both in South Africa and beyond our borders. Representatives from the South African legislative sector support. Representatives from the National Conference of State Legislatures in the United States of America, members of the NGO and NPO sector. In her absence, Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos from the Washington State Legislature. A very good day to you all across all parts of the globe and in different time zones. On behalf of the Western Cape Women Parliamentarians, we are honored to have you participate on this special occasion marking Women's Month in South Africa. As Michelle Obama once so aptly said, and I quote, no country can ever truly flourish if it stifles the potential of its women and deprives itself of the contributions of half of its citizens. And as complex as that may seem, we as parliamentarians and legislators are here today to bring bold resolutions to the table that could assist in changing the crises women face in this country. Today's session centers on the broad theme, placing the dignity and innate rights of women in the spotlight. I emphasize dignity as the basis of this theme. And Donna Hicks, the author of Dignity, the essential role it plays in resolving conflict, explains it so perfectly, and I quote, she says, the most common response people offer is that dignity is about respect. To the contrary, she says, dignity is not the same as respect. Dignity is our inherent value and worth as human beings. Everyone is born with it. Respect, on the other hand, is earned through one's actions. After people learn about dignity, a remarkable thing happens, she says. Everyone recognizes that we all have a deep human desire to be treated as something of value. Today's speakers and breakaway sessions will look at the broader issues that specifically feed into the legislative space. We are hoping that the ideas and the resolutions that come out from today will be bold and will show courage and commitment to changing the trajectory of women in South Africa. There will be three sub themes discussed in the breakaway sessions and will be streamed live on our YouTube channel today. The themes are addressing the gender pay gap, and we know that South Africa sits at approximately a 30% gap estimate. We will also engage on the adoption of a gender responsive budget, which used to exist in South Africa, but no longer is being applied. And we will talk about the increasing of enrollment of women in STEM related university programs. To the women of this province, we honor you as we engage on these big issues. We look forward to today's program as we unpack the difficult challenges that women face. As women parliamentarians and ultimately as legislators, we commit to bringing tangible resolutions to this parliament that can make the meaning change we all seek. I thank you. Just a few notes before we actually begin the program. 
I would like to ensure that all participants actually make sure that their microphones are being muted. Please use the raise hand function if you would like the opportunity to speak and wait until you've been recognized by the presiding officer. Participants are kindly requested to unmute their microphones when they are recognized by the presiding officer and to please mute their microphones when they have finished speaking. Participants are requested not to sign into MS Teams on more than one device, so either on your laptop or on your cell phone. And before we start with the formal proceedings, some of the participants in our event have not yet indicated exactly which breakaway session they would like to attend. I would appreciate it if you could just as write that in the chat function so that the officials can assign you to the correct session before we get onto the program. And of course, as it is a live event, I forgot a very important part, which I suppose is quite usual, and that was to introduce myself. So my apologies to everyone that doesn't really know who I am. So my name is Beverly Schaefer, and I am the Deputy Speaker of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. We will now go on to the formal proceedings. I invite the Speaker of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, Honourable Masizolim Kasela, who has been a long-time politician and is serving as Speaker in this House during this term, to actually take and give us his welcome message. Welcome, um, welcome Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And uh, I must say that this feels so, so beautiful. You know, when you started talking about having this platform and inviting all these guests, I knew exactly what we can expect, but I didn't know it would go this far. So I just want to say thank you very much to you, Deputy Speaker, and for putting this program together with our outstanding CWP, uh, Western Cape Provincial Parliament branch, and of course, with the phenomenal staff members of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, uh, who have tirelessly worked very hard to ensure that this event does succeed. I would like to welcome the members of the executive in our Western Cape government uh, who are present here, and those who have uh, tendered apologies, uh, I would like to really appreciate the, the, the participation in this, in this particular event. And of course, I would, not done, I would not have done justice, Honorable Deputy Speaker, if I don't mention just the name of our dear friend, uh, Honorable Shandana Khan. I want to say thank you, ma'am, uh, again, and welcome for joining us. We miss seeing each other in person. But you know that uh, soon that come that time will come again. Uh, to the honourable members of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, I wish to welcome you all, and of course to all the guests who are representing organisations in the entire province, and to the distinguished guests who are connecting from the international organisations, and of course to everybody that has taken time to be part of this event. The Deputy Speaker has welcomed you all and mentioned you by name, and I don't want to hurt anyone by not mentioning you, so I will say all protocols observed. That is what we do in South Africa. That means everyone has been acknowledged. Uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, I do wish, and of course I hope, that as we embark today in this program, we will speak essentially on what exactly it means um, as the Western Cape Provincial Parliament to be representing the people of this province and what does it mean uh, to the women who find themselves without voice and what does it mean to women who have no food? What does it mean to children, girl children who are sitting at home without any prospects of hope because the environment that they find themselves does not seem to be as equal in, in terms of the standards that we expect. So I do expect that in terms of the Article 1 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
which states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, that will be able to articulate what does that, what does that, what does this mean for the people of the Western Cape, represented by the Western Cape Provincial Parliament? The Constitution of the Republic of South Africa Act 108 of 1996, which guarantees a full range of rights to all citizens, the rights to life, dignity, privacy, and many more. What does this mean to the people of the Western Cape as we articulate here today? Section 9, titled Equality, however, specifically protects the rights of women, Honorable Deputy Speaker. And it states that the, 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 the state may not unfairly discriminate or indirectly against, directly or indirectly against anyone on one or more grounds, including race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, ethnic or, or gender um, origin, uh, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, and birth. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the prohibition of discrimination on the grounds of gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status is deliberately intended to protect women. So the gender pay parity that the deputy speaker mentioned is, and many other issues that will be articulated here today is one of the serious inequalities that we've seen in our, in our generation, both as humanity and of course as politicians. So we need to really find solutions and of course in dealing with the issues of gender-based violence, uh, femicide, the issues of rape, sexual harassment, the murder and the brutal killings that we've seen of our women in the province and nationally. Uh, also dealing with the rights of the LGBTQIA plus communities and of course, <laughs> Honorable Deputy Speaker, the issues of homophobia are real issues. Queerphobia and transphobia are real issues. So I would like to encourage you all as I welcome you all here today. That is this provincial parliament. We are greatly honored and really appreciate your presence here. And we do hope that you are going to engage honestly and truthfully in finding solutions to the daily challenges that confront us. And it can it cannot be a better moment, Deputy Speaker. This is the great time in history. In the height of COVID-19 pandemic, that this parliament has chosen to continue with this particular uh, provincial women's parliament, which is now an international women's parliament. Don't call it anything else. It's an international women's parliament because we've got all of these guests from everywhere. And also to appreciate what we have done to invite the other uh, provincial parliaments, you know, the staff from other parliaments, and obviously some of our colleagues, you know, members of parliament who have been invited to participate here today. But I am very much standing here elated at the work that you have done with the CWP branch, and I think. Uh, Honorable Khan will be very much pleased that the work that she started here to come and launch this branch, that this branch has done so much that it has invited all these beautiful people here on this platform. Um, our work is not done, we have just begun. And I can say that uh, the deputy speaker and all these breakaways, you'll see that there's different number, mem member of parliaments, members of parliament who are going to be chairing some of the sessions here. It's a multi-party dimension. And it's women who come from different political dimensions, from different political backgrounds, different philosophies, but what binds these women here is the fact that we need to fight for the rights of every woman. The rights of every women, all of all women in the Western Cape. And of course, in ensuring that those who are professionals and those who have no school and those who are well educated do find resonance in the work that we do as the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. That we don't represent a particular grouping and leave other 
uh, sectors and the elitist at this parliament. So this parliament is a parliament of all people. We speak for every woman, for all women. Those who have a voice in this parliament are able to elevate the voices of the voiceless. And that is very important as you continue here today. And I will not be staying, I will not be participating in the program and I will not be staying uh, throughout the program, but I will stick around just to watch. All I wanted to do here was to appreciate and welcome you here. I do know that this will be a successful event. The deputy speaker has told me that there's nothing that is as exciting as what she has been able to work and put together with the CW, CWP branch and our provincial parliament staff. And for that matter, Deputy Speaker, uh, you must pat yourself in the back because it's not easy to put a program online and get people to attend on time. We've waited in some in some far away. <laughs> you start the event starts an hour later, and you get apologies all the time. We're still waiting. We're still waiting. But here, your guest arrived on time. And remember, we've got five districts in the Western Cape, from the Overberg, the Garden Route. Central Karoo, West Coast, and the Cape Winelands, including the city of Cape Town, Cape Metropole. These women are here. And you told me, Deputy Speaker, that you will also be taking this to the districts afterwards. And that is something that is unique about this women's parliament. So thank you very much and good luck to you all. And may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to our Speaker of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. Uh, thank you for the support. Um, without our entire team of parliamentarians, we just can't work uh, and get this together. So thank you very much. I would like to um, now move on to the next part of the program. Honorable Shandana Gulzer Khan is the chairperson of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians CWP Network and as a member of the National Assembly of Pakistan. A legal profession a professional with extensive knowledge and experience in international trade, economic law and policy, she has written on Pakistan's first IP framework, e-commerce policy and GI law. Besides having served as Parliamentary Secretary for Commerce and Industry, Honorable Shandana chairs the subcommittee on agricultural products, focusing on women farmers, workers and youth. She also heads the Parliamentary Task Force on the SDGs 5 and is helping develop Pakistan's first SDG roadmap. Part of that work is focusing on quick results for girl-child marriage restraint legislation. Honorable Shandana is also serving in committees on industry and production, privatization and planning and development. It is my absolute honor to have Honorable Shandana Khan here this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Deputy Speaker Pavel Jeffa. I hope I'm audible to everyone. You are audible. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also, it's a pity uh, the Honorable Speaker couldn't stay any longer because it was such a, such a pleasure to see him after a, what seems like a very long time. COVID feels like seven lifetimes rolled into one. And I wanted to, at the outset, uh, state both uh, my gratitude uh, for both your friendship and the way I was treated when I was in Western Cape, the invitation which was given to the CWP, the way Mr. Ahmad Patience, who I hope is here in this meeting, and, and the kind of things we discussed, because even though, Deputy Speaker, you invited me to the event, uh, but, oh, great, um, the speaker's here. Good to see you, uh, Honorable Speaker. I really wanted to make the point that without male champions of gender equality, we're not going anywhere. We need male champions who believe that gender equality is beyond women's rights and human rights and being out on the street and protesting. So, so for me, that in itself was an incredible experience because I saw that if a single province in South Africa could do a turnaround so quickly, reviving the women uh, caucus, the, the CWP branch of the Western Cape, it could not have been possible. Uh, that's not to take strength away from you, Honorable Beverly Schaefer, but to say that 
the fact that the speaker stood behind you was visible to all of us observing from uh, CWP and CPA based in London. So thank you all. Um, also, it's a pleasure to see my friend, Honorable Dr. Zainab Gimba here. She is the chair of CWP Africa. She's also the vice chair of CWP International. And I think it's a rather good day for me. I don't know if I mentioned to you, I nearly didn't make it to our meeting today. As, as we speak, I'm in Zambia as an electoral monitor for the Commonwealth. And we've been experiencing Wi-Fi blackouts and internet blackouts since yesterday afternoon. So right now I am on an illegal app called a VPN uh, just because I had to attend this meeting. But uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you all for inviting me today. Thank you for keeping the CWP in the loop because I find that perhaps when it comes to resolving women parliamentarians issues, women staffer issues and women's issues overall. We're 50% of the population. We may not be 50% of parliaments, but we are 50% of all national populations. And so until and unless we're made a priority by those who work with us, who sit with us, and as I mentioned, your honorable speaker of the Western Cape province, things will not go very far. Uh, as discussed previously, uh, honorable deputy speaker, I would like to focus on a couple of things and since I'm here at this event, request for help both from CWP Africa and from South African parliaments as a whole. Uh, you're aware that because of this pandemic, the world has shifted gears rapidly uh, and, and coping has been mentally difficult because we were in a certain comfort zone where you know, men were bad, women were good, corporations were bad, NGOs were good. All that has flown out of the window during the pandemic. And we've been forced yeah. to, uh, sorry, I think somebody's speaker's on. And so this uh, pandemic has forced us to look at problems in a different way because in some sense, we don't have the time. We just don't have the time to wait and see what happens in the next electoral cycle. We all know very well that women's development issues, I will not call them human rights issues, I'll call them development issues, are closely linked to electoral finance. That is the bottom line for me. That is what I have observed. If as a woman you don't bring value to the table in your constituency, in your electoral system, then your issues will also not make it to the decision-making table. They will not make it to the finance ministry. So given how the, 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 the four topics you have picked today, and I find them incredibly important, you're talking about LGBTQ, you're talking about women in STEM, which is science, technology, mathematics, engineering, you're also talking about the gender pay, pay gap, and you're also talking about gender-sensitive budgeting. Now, um, I, I guess in some sense I'll be politically incorrect, but it, I guess it's important to set out at the outset that women in STEM is not a polit politically correct subject. People don't want to talk about it because these are hidden biases. Why would anyone talk about women in science and technology? There are no barriers to science and technology for women. Where are they? Show us the barriers. But when you look at the supply chain of how women start as a little girl, from the day she gets to parliament or to her office or to her bank or to her, as a nursing hospital, uh, women will face countless barriers that men may also face, but you'll face it at a disproportional strength. So first, yourself as a, a woman, sort of worthy of being accepted in your workspace, and then you have to prove yourself as a professional worthy of being in that space. My male colleagues don't have to do that. Now, I could either cry about it or I could accept it and work with worthy male colleagues, for example, the UN program. And this I would urge you, Honorable Speaker, if you could uh, look this up, and Deputy Speaker, if you could push this. The United Nations program, the UN Women program, which is called, it's literally an at, he for she, male champions of gender equality. And I was lucky that after South Africa, after Western Cape, I went to Iceland, where I had the pleasure of meeting the Icelandic president, who is the Icelandic champion for the He For She program. He has adopted it. He is their spokesperson. And as the joke goes, I have a mother, he said, I have a wife and I have three daughters. So there is no way I cannot champion for their equality. And so if the Western Cape Parliament could start with this and spread to all of um, the rest of South Africa and also request your Honorable Dr. Zainab Gimba, if you could champion this, talk to CPA Africa that let every male speaker, every male deputy speaker become the spokesperson and the point person for the he for she program of you and women. That is my first request from the CWP international side to everyone. That is important. You will see the progress you will make. It will be very quick. Number two, 
I would recommend everyone to read the papers that have been prepared by the Western Cape Parliament. They're very well-written papers. Uh, They're self-explanatory. They explain a lot of things about what is going wrong and what are the quick solutions. Because I think in the pandemic, what we cannot afford to do as a global sisterhood is to wait for others to give us the solutions. We'll have to create them. And there's nothing wrong in that. If we're being asked to step up, we asked for power. Now we've been given power. Let's exercise it. My third request to you today is that the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, both me and Honorable Dr. Zainab Kimba, we worked very hard over the last two years since we took office to produce uh, products, to produce documents, to produce policies that would help the entire women in the Commonwealth. Now, since uh, our election was um, September, October 2019, and the COVID lockdown started happening as early as January and February 2020, we didn't have much time to get any work done because travel was required, meetings were required. So what we've done in that time is we've released three important things. We did modules with the IPU, uh, which were focusing on SDG 5, Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is part of the Agenda 2030. And those videos are for male parliamentarians to understand what does it mean to advance women's equality and empowerment in a political context. We've also produced uh, in collaboration with the APF, the, the sister version of uh, CWP, um, the, fr the Francophonie, uh, the, we got guidelines from them on anti-harassment. And I have to thank you, um, Honorable Schaefer, that if you recall, uh, you had mentioned to me while I was in the Western Cape that female staffers of the Western Cape wanted to meet with me to discuss. And you know, one question which they put to me, which I found heartbreaking at one point, they said, Madam, if you cannot protect, me being CWP, women staffers in the Western Cape, how can you expect to protect the country? How can you expect to protect the continent? And that hit me really hard. And so we teamed up with APF. We got the Quebec uh, anti-harassment guidelines. And now we have sent those uh, uh, approved guidelines as per CWP voting. And 180 different branches of, CW, uh, of Commonwealth parliaments have those guidelines. So I would request through your good officer speaker, through your good officer's deputy speaker, to ensure that those guidelines are adopted in all of South Africa by each parliament separately. And once those are done, they are actually, because it's not a legislative piece that you have to do, it's a policy document that will come into all contracts for all women that are hired by your parliament. So not only women parliamentarians, but also female and even junior male staffers who might be victims of targeted harassment, they have protection, statutory protection through their contracts. The third thing the CWP, Dr. Zainab Gimba and I did, was creating a gender sensitization toolkit with our lovely team in London, which is Benit, James, Aksa. Uh, and we were incredibly uh, lucky that we got Dr. Sarah Childs, who's an expert on women parliamentarian, parliamentarian issues. That is a toolkit, again, which all of CWP Africa, as well as Western Cape, could be the starting point to adopt those policy guidelines and actually have a roadshow in your parliament, sensitizing both female and you know that there is a female patriarchy as well. It's not just, you know, man is not the enemy. We have patriarchy, which is what's settled in our bones. So if we could adopt those guidelines, run those through, it's COVID times, people don't have much to do. That's not to say parliamentarians are not working. But those three things would be so useful as a concrete follow on from what we discussed in Western Cape for what has been happening in CWP International and let Africa lead as always. Because I have to say, Dr. Zainab Gimba was kind. She invited me to Arusha in October 2019, right after our election, where I observed CWP Africa in action. And I have to say, I'm very impressed. CWP, at present, we're working on a constitution, but we don't have CP Africa does. CWP Africa does. So I would request everyone here today that given that you are uh, miles ahead of many of us in the Commonwealth, ahead of 180 different parliaments, be the first to adopt these. I'll be incredibly grateful. And perhaps final word on gender budgeting and the pay gap. I think it's high time we'd recognize that it's one thing to protect women from violence, another to give them political rights, another to give them human rights. But till women don't have financial inclusivity in our policy, in our finance ministry, in our national budgets, I'm afraid the game is going to stay where it is. And I don't know if you remember, I've been following the feminist movement in the United States for many years. And there was Jermaine Greer from the UK, a lot of people from the United States. And these women did say one thing which was interesting. It was tough 
at the time, but it was interesting. They said that when we started the women's equality movement, we didn't promise you equality culturally because cultures take their own time in changing. We promised you financial equality. We promised you economic equality. So maybe if we focus on that, we will have far better results than focusing on cultural problems that we all face in our own jurisdictions and international jurisdictions. I think I've done my 10 minutes. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for being a lovely uh, group of people to talk to. I will require. I will stay online, but uh, I'll not. You'll not be able to see me because, as I said, I'm working on a VPN, and I'm headed for the airport in about half an hour. So you'll excuse me that I may not be able to respond to questions if there are any directly. But if you were to send them in writing um, through the good offices of the honourable speaker, deputy speaker, or to Senator Kimba, I'm very happy to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honourable Khan. Before you go and before you switch your screen off, um, I would just like to recognise Premier Alan Windy, who is very kindly and um, has made some time to actually log on, uh, Honourable Khan. So he's here while while you have been speaking, and I thank him for making some time to be able to do that. Um, really a great pleasure. Thank you, Premier. That That means a lot, and I know that um, Honourable Khan feels the same way. And I know you are a great, um, a great proponent for women's rights and women equality. So thank you very, very much. Um, before I carry on and ask um, Honourable uh, Chief Wapwinga to just uh, come on, I'd just like to ask those that are not speaking, may I please ask that you switch your cameras off so that the feed is actually correctly Portioned. So please, if you are only uh, viewing um, at the moment, please switch your camera off. But before you do anything, Honourable Khan, I would like to hand over to Honourable Chief Whip uh, Murray Winger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It really is my privilege as the Chief Whip. Have we lost um, Honourable Wenger? It's it seems we have. If I can just ask the IT staff, Honourable Wenger, are you there? Am I back online? Yes. Would you start again? Okay, here we are. My apologies. Um, thank you again. It's my privilege as the Chief of the Legislature to give a vote of thanks to Honourable Shandana Gulzar Khan. Um, as we know, the theme of today's par Women's Parliament is placing the dignity and the innate rights of women in the spotlight. And as women parliamentarians, we indeed have a responsibility to shine a light on the systemic problems that prevent women from realizing their potential and affording them dignity and ensuring their rights. Last year, women parliamentarians for the first time reached 25% globally. But this just also highlights how far away we are from true representation and adequate participation of women in politics. But it's not just about the numbers. Aisha Tariam, the first Middle Eastern female editor in chief of an English language newspaper said, there needs to be a fundamental shift in the way societies view women in government. One that does not see them as mere seat fillers or stats on a chart they must be viewed as a vital contributing factor to the betterment of the world. Honorable Shandana Gulzar Khan is one of those women who is a vital contributor to the betterment of our world. And at a time when the stakes couldn't be higher and our collective future is in jeopardy. It really struck me when she said that as women parliamentarians with levers of power, we need to create opportunities for change and should review systemic, often hidden barriers in all their complexity so that we can solve these problems. And so on behalf of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament and the Women's Caucus, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks to her, not only for her leadership of the CWP, but for the incredible insights and inspiration she has provided us with today, as well as the very many women she inspires each and every day to continue the struggle for the realization of women's dignity and rights. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chief Whip uh, Murray Wenger. Thank you for your time, Honorable um, Shandana Khan. Thank you once again. 
and uh, always for making for always making time for us. We will move on now. I'd like to welcome Honorable Zainab Gimba, who is currently the chairperson of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians for the Africa region and vice chairman for the CWP International. She started her public service career as a lecturer in the Department of Public Administration, University of Maiduguru, Nigeria in 2002. Before her election to parliament, she had at different times between 2011 and 2018 served as commissioner in charge of poverty alleviation and youth empowerment, universal basic education board and water resources in her home state of Borno in Nigeria. Honorable Gimba's outstanding public service delivery was rewarded when her people prevailed on her to represent them at the Nigeria House of Representatives. Thus, she was elected in 2019 to represent Ngala, Bama and Kala federal constitu constituency in the Nigeria House of Representatives. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree and a Master of Public Administration from the University of Maiduguri in the Borno state of Nigeria. Her quest for knowledge saw her proceeding to the University of, of, of Boju, Nigeria, to pursue a course of study in public administration and policy analysis, leading to the award of a PhD in public administration and policy analysis in 2008. She is also a fellow Chartered Institute of Public Diplomacy and Management, a member of the Development Study Association, United Kingdom, and many other professional bodies. Honorable Gimba has received many rewards and recognitions from professional and trade union bodies in Nigeria for her service in community development and empowerment of vulnerable women. In a few years as Member of Parliament, Honorable Gimba has demonstrated keen interest and promotion of gender related issues. Honorable Gimba, it is a great privilege to have you here this morning. Good morning. Morning. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Fabulous Gimba, and all other participants. Thank you. And I should thank you, Honorable uh, Shandana, my chair, for having her time to be present at this all important program. Am I audible? You are audible and you may proceed. Thank you. Okay. Well, I first before I, uh, I go into my brief presentation, I would like us to uh, pay tribute to our late chairperson, uh, late Her Excellency Honorable Lifaka Majua, who we lost. Please this year and uh, I think we should have a mini silence for her. This is the first time we are meeting in such a fora. I was at her burial representing CP and I think she deserves to have a minute of silence. Honourable Kimba, I think that is a wonderful idea. Before we have the minute silence, can I just ask that all the other participants please switch off their cameras and please um, uh, mute their microphones. We will begin with the one minute silence. Thank you. Over to you, Honorable Gimba. Honorable Gimbe, you can hear me? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, well, I'm happy to be with, uh, in your mix today uh, because the promotion of dignity of women is the promotion of human rights. The theme of this sitting is very instructive in view of the prevailing global pandemic that has affected almost every facet of life and has created the gender gap because women are more affected in this pandemic. While it is true that everyone is affected, I know, but women are most affected by the pandemic in many ways. And uh, if you look at societal institutions, including traditional religious bodies and their leaders have key role in, in holding the uh, dignity and uh, human rights of women. 
uh, this is as important as any practices that limits women's ability to be heard and contribute to her development and that of our society, because that will demean her humanity and amounts to abuse of human rights. Let it be noted that every woman has the right to live a dignified life and uh, that is free from discriminations, that are free from all forms of abuse and violence, etc. Uh, we must therefore push for a change of societal norms and practices that attempt to take away this rights from, from us, from all women. We must also make deliberate efforts to increase women representation, especially in the parliaments and other government positions. And uh, because if you look at uh, issues of public policy positions, there are not enough women to represent while we constitute a great percentage of the population, we have very little percentage to represent us. So it is important that in parliament and other uh, public uh, policy positions, women has to be enabled to take direct involvement in actions aimed at shaping their socioeconomic well-being. I just want to give an example, for instance, in Nigeria, the early budget has been lacking in many specific provisions for the women of gender-related issues, as it generalizes its provisions irrespective of inherent peculiarities. A gender-based budgeting does not mean creating a separate budget, but one that improves transparency, participation, and gender analysis of national budgets. Our budget assumes everyone is carried along. For instance, a gender sensitive budget for a ministry should show how allocation of budget, total budget is made and how such allocation benefits women and men, girls and boys in a given society. Essentially, national budget should benefit everyone. But it is not like that. So these are one of the issues I just want to bring because I'm sure in every part of the world, it is just something similar that is happening. And over time, uh, the CWP Africa in various, in the region, in different countries, we have, uh, we have a, a kind of um, started a conversation on how a particular group from the CWP will look at these issues because it is the, the economic, uh, the, the economic empowerment of women has to start with the national budget because that is where we should be considered. That is the the, where the planning should take appropriate measures. So we are now working with all parliaments within Africa to ensure that these things are all inclusive in our budgets, especially in the next coming 2022. So when we, when we come to, when we come to budget, um, I mean, when we come to the right of women, the human rights, is women's rights. And if you look at some, uh, uh, for instance, and if you look at the Universal Declaration, our rights are all unenable. They can't be taken away or given away. Every woman has the right to live in dignity, free of fear, coercion, violence, and discrimination. Every woman has the right to health, including sexual and reproductive health. Yet, for hundreds of millions of girls and women worldwide, these human rights are denied. The Universal Declaration says that we are born equal in dignity and rights. This is dignity that we have, which entitled us to this rights is also inalienable. Numerous international and regional instruments have drawn attention to gender related dimensions of human rights issues. The most important being the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, adopted in 1979. Uh, participants years after CEDO entered into force, the United Nations World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna confirmed that women's rights were human rights. That this statement was even necessary is striking. Because women's status as human beings entitled to rights should have never been in doubt. 
And yet, this was a step forward in recognizing the rightful claims of one half of humanity. In a defined neglect of women's rights at the human rights valuation in all across the globe. Because women constitute almost half of the world population and are one of the main stakeholders of every society. That, that is no doubt. They play unique roles in the societal and family system. Sometimes a woman appears as a mother, sometimes as a wife, and sometimes as a daughter. All these roles are respected and dignified. Despite all these international treaties, state laws, government schemes, and programs for women empowerment, equal, uh, 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 I mean, equal rights and the, uh, and the girls' education, the condition of women in contemporary Africa is deplorable. Their rights are continually evaluated through genital mutilation, women trafficking, domestic violence, discrimination at work. The societal status of women in the parochial society seems to be dependent on their men. They are denied access to social justice and inequality. The harsh reality is that the building blocks of discrimination against women lie within the very systems that are supposed to nurture and defend them, namely the family and the community, and the societal perception of men being more superior to women is accepted. This narrative is, uh, I mean, this narrative is ingrained in the consciousness of children, even at very young ages. Covert women's, uh, uh, mean, women's right is human rights. She has the right to take decision on issues about her life. Of course, it is her life. And, and that that right should not be denied. Her sexual, uh, I mean, if you look at sexual reproductive right and health, right to consent in marriage, the right to property, right to qualitative education, right to political, civil participation, labor and employment, among others. We must continually place issues that, uh, you know, concerns women in the front banner because violence against women is not inevitable. Families and uh, communities can change social norms and attitudes. Governments can put strong laws in place, enforce them, and bring perpetrators to justice. A strange, I mean, a more stiffer uh, of penalties. And societies can guarantee the right to sexual and reproductive health, which includes services to family planning, maternal health and HIV prevention, and the ability to make free and informed choices among reproduction. There have been great and uh, commendable contributions over the years of women in various parliaments in Africa, but we must up the ante by providing deliberate and robust legislative safeguards as it concerns the economic empowerment access to education, political space, and the total abolition of all dehumanizing cultural practices against women, not only in Africa, but in the, in the world. The use of the media as a platform for advocacy against, you know, practices inhibiting women from harnessing their full potentials must be made available so that women can easily be able to fulfill their purpose in, choose, in their chosen endeavors. Uh, the justice system as an arbitrator uh, should be seen as uh, unbiased in the dispensation of justice to perpetrators of violence against women. Especially the fact that if you see a, a, a girl is a, a, in a society, a girl is raped, and then that culprit is still moving around freely without taking any action by the law, which is very painful. And that is the main reason why women usually keep quiet, even when they are dehumanized. Uh, Honorable DPC Speaker, I don't know if my time is off. Welcome to finish off, Honorable Gimba. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I want to further say, just to give an example, maybe people can have um, some little knowledge about my country in Nigeria. We are convinced that a coordinated and comprehensive approach will move us closer to a world where women and girls can live free from fear, violence, and discrimination. Uh, well, uh, reach to at least to reach their full potential and enjoy equal opportunity and uh, even mutual respect and convenience, confidence with men. 
So therefore we have set up in that respect, an agency of government or agencies, I can say it's not even only one, which are saddled with responsibility of addressing and protecting the rights and dignity of women. These agencies are the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Person, which was created on the 14th of July, 2003 by the, tra uh, by the Trafficking in Persons Provision Act. And that uh, agency is doing very well. It goes round across the world to ensure that traffic girls or uh, women are brought back and rehabilitated in the country. And another one is the National Human Rights Commission which was also established by an act in 1995 through legislation, which is essentially a wider functioning covering Vesta spaces and free to waive publics of uh, fundamental mutation. We in the National Assembly, through the instrumentality of the law, have introduced bill on the discrimination against women and other related matters bill in 2006 and a bill for an act seeking to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women has killed a second reason presently at the uh, uh, House of Representatives. This will help to enforce the protocol on the African Charter on uh, you know, human and people's rights, on the rights of women, despite all the legal uh, provisions and government endeavors, the ground reality is very different. You know, Women are still not being treated as equal to men in our continent. Uh, the parochial mindset should be discarded with in in a 21st century of first modernization and we must realize that women remain an integral part of the human community and that it will be impossible to consider socio-economic and societal transformation honorable deputy speaker in isolation without women and men together playing their due development role so i think uh, we i'm just enjoying on all these our participants on all leaders we must make an attempt of building a dignified image of women in our continent. Once the image of equality is established among people, it will last for long and forever. So my plea is for all of us to put our hands on deck to work to ensure that we build this image in the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Gimba. Some very um very important words there, but I would like to invite, before you close your screen, I would like to invite Honourable Nomin Kondlaw to be giving her vote of thanks on behalf of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. Honourable Nkondlaw, are you there? There you go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, let me also uh, greet and um, uh, thank uh, this opportunity uh, most importantly, let me say to Honorable Gimba, uh, in my language, Kosa Ngosi, uh, the wise, wise words that you have shared with us, uh, that indeed I want to confirm with you that human rights are women's rights. And indeed, as a woman, we want to welcome and appreciate women professionals, women in the academia like yourselves, as we have heard of your credentials that there is a big role that you can play in reshaping politics, in reshaping the public sector, because that is where decisions about policies, about legislations that affect the ordinary lives of women. Further than that, the knowledge that uh, is created in the academic space, the knowledge that is produced by women in their day-to-day -day activities in communities, women must be able, as you had already alluded to that fact, to influence and inform policy. No longer, after all these years and centuries, we must continue to have legislations, policies that treat women as if they do not exist. We need to ensure that the information, the knowledge that we create, the knowledge that we interact with also in our parliaments, bolster civil society, strengthen community activists and women who sit and look after their households. I want to appreciate um, your presence and your wise words, Honorable Gumbi. As a gender activist yourself, I think the awards that you have already received in your country, 
the fact that even at this point you are chairing at an international level Commonwealth uh, Parliament is also a demonstration of the power of women. And indeed, if we consider now, 42 years later, the UN Declaration Against Discrimination on Women, Girls and Children, we must be a generation of women that is impatient on realizing exactly what you have said of ensuring that we build a dignified image of women in the continent. On behalf of the provincial uh, Western Cape Provincial Parliament, uh, women also in other legislatures that have joined us, I want to say once again, thank you very much uh, for the words that you have shared. And I think we will be going into our conversations with um, uh, that information, the insights that you have provided to us and be better in the debates that we are going to take up. Thank you very much. Ingos. Thank you. And honorable thank speaker, I think um, I should commend you for this kind of program of his kind I have ever attended. And it has impressed me even from the program, from the papers presented overview. And I think I must confess to you that I have taken it from today to encourage other parliaments to have similar things and will also enjoin on you for your insight, for your help, for your support while we work in other parliaments in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Gimba, and we are always happy to assist. And in the end of the day, it's all about a unified and, and a team approach. So thank you very much, and thank you for your time. We really appreciate um, your words. Thank you. You're most welcome. I now uh, would like to welcome the representative Sharon, Ms. Sharon Santos from the Democratic member, as a member of the Washington State Legislature. She was a community activist for more than 40 years. Sharon Tamika Santos was elected to the Washington State House of Representatives in 1998. Representative Santos chairs the House Education Committee and serves on the House Capital Budget Committee and Consumer Protection and Business Committee. She also serves appointments to the Washington State Education Opportunity Gap Accountability and Oversight Committees the Every Student Succeeds Act Consolidated Plan Team, and the Financial Education Public-Private Partnership. Her legislative proposals reflect her strong advocacy for providing quality early learning programs for young kids, ensuring a well-trained educator workforce, and closing the opportunity gap. Representative Santos believes Washington State must strive for providing education excellence and opportunities for all students to learn. Outside of her education, her key policy interests include civil rights, women's rights, economic and environmental justice, affordable housing and quality public education. She believes in providing level playing fields that allow those who work hard to succeed. Representative Santos has served on dozens of boards and foundations, including the Boys and Girls Clubs in the King County National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and the University of Washington Business and Economic Development Program Board of Ambassadors. She has received numerous awards for her legislative and community work, including the Kiptakuda Community Leadership Award from the Asian Pacific Islander Community Leadership Foundation and the Leadership and Vision Award from Junior Achievement of Washington. A graduate of the Evergreen State College and Northeastern University, Ms. Santos has worked in the banking industry on staff to local public elected officials and in senior management positions for nonprofit organizations. Due to the time difference, the immense time difference, Ms. Uh, Representative Santos has very kindly done a pre-recording address for us to view. Thank you very much, Ms. Santos. Over to the IT. Madam Deputy Speaker Schiffer, thank you for your gracious and generous introduction. I am grateful to the Western Cape Provincial Parliament Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians Network for the privilege of addressing this august body. 
As a sister lawmaker, I offer my warmest greetings and congratulations to each of you and joined in this important endeavor to place the dignity and innate rights of women in the spotlight. This moment is especially gratifying to me since I enjoyed the distinct opportunity to visit your provincial parliament in 2009 as a delegate with the National Conference of State Legislatures and our Women's Legislative Network. Thank you all for your hospitality then and now. That trip remains as one of the most educational and inspirational experiences of my lifetime. In 1995, I reacted similarly after organizing the largest delegation of women from Western Washington to attend the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women in China. The fact that these two experiences rank highest among the most meaningful and memorable for me is probably not coincidental. Each trip focused on women and, as articulated in the Beijing Platform for Action, on what is necessary for our quote, active participation in all spheres of public and private life through a full and equal share in economic, social, cultural, and political decision-making, end quote. Indeed, I can and do credit my participation in the UN Women's Conference as the preliminary instigation for my campaign to elected office a few years later. What I saw then at the NGO Forum, forum was to me extraordinary, a universal display of women's inherent wisdom and power from every sector of the globe and every segment of society, fusing and forging together as one unified movement, a movement dedicated to an agenda for women's empowerment. I ask for a moment of your indulgence to join me in remembering what that NGO forum was like. Please. Close your eyes. Soon you see a light, initially soft, but growing, brilliant, bright, intense. And then you notice colors, vivid, vibrant colors, red, blue, yellow, green, purple, orange, everywhere. Now you can distinguish forms and movement, flowing robes, Graceful female figures of all shapes, sizes, and skin tones, dancing, twirling, marching, and you hear sounds, sounds of music, woodwinds, drums, stringed instruments, and voices. First one, then several, and finally hundreds, no thousands of voices of women talking, singing, laughing, shouting, all at the same time. <sighs> this cacophony of sight and sound will forever represent to me the global sisterhood, beautiful, alive, and moving forward. For indeed, tens of thousands of women from all around the world had come together to develop a global vision for our future, a community in which women's voices and visions are valued. What I see now represented in the agenda of your women's parliament is a continuation, the ongoing expression of this movement, our movement, to center the intrinsic dignity and the innate rights of women and girls in the policies, practices, and laws of the Western Cape province shaping your beautiful part of the world into a place where women's voices and visions are valued. And I am filled with gratitude and immense excitement for you and for the promise which this day holds. I'm excited because the policies you will be discussing this afternoon are as real and as relevant to women in Washington state as they are to women in Western Cape province. Gender pay inequity, gender responsive budgeting, increased female participation in STEM related fields. These are global concerns which demand our attention and our action as women and as lawmakers, no matter where we live or serve. 
Since I serve as the chairwoman of education for my legislative chamber, I am especially interested in our shared concern about disproportionality in educational outcomes for girls and other marginalized groups of students, not only as a matter of equity, but as a fundamental national security strategy. Because in the 21st century, the welfare of our peoples and our nations will require the full participation of each and every person among us. Our education systems are after all the pipeline to our economic systems. Still, old beliefs and ways of working cling stubbornly to these systems. What we recognize today is institutional bias. How do we demolish these barriers which impede the advancement of our daughters and granddaughters broader educational endeavors. In Washington, our deliberations focus on data, on educator training and engaging the community beyond the schoolhouse doors. The legislature established the Educational Opportunity Gap Oversight and Accountability Committee as a permanent statutory body to monitor and provide ongoing oversight of the myriad ways inequities surface for our students and to make recommendations for eliminating all sources of these inequities within the education systems of the state. We highlighted the need to collect disaggregated data in order to better see and understand the inequities. Thus, while it's commonly accepted knowledge that girls generally outperform boys academically, not all girls do. Data that disaggregate based on race, English language proficiency, and poverty show distinct differences in academic outcomes among girls. Once revealed, we are better positioned to develop tailored responses to the specific needs of each student. Like you, we know that learned gender biased attitudes and stereotypes must be deliberately unlearned. So we require the adoption of equity, culture, diversity, and inclusion competency standards for our educators and staff who work with students. These standards are infused in the curricula of our colleges of teacher and principal of education, as well as in mandatory professional development, recertification requirements, and job evaluation criteria. When girls begin exhibiting a loss of confidence in their abilities, our educators must be prepared to re-engage them in every academic pursuit. And finally, we recognize that our schools and our educators cannot provide all of the supports our students need. So we seek out opportunities to partner with NGOs and businesses throughout the state to bolster student interest, engagement, and participation. In this space, Washington is fortunate to have so many resources, including programs such as Girls Who Code, or Girls in Science, as well as organizations such as Women in Science and Engineering, or WISE, and Washington STEM. These organizations help provide girls with opportunities as well as mentors. Because as we often note, you cannot be what you cannot see. If I took any lesson from the UN Conference on Women, it is this. We have so much to learn from one another. We all face some type of gender bias and discrimination, and we all experience some measure of gender inequity. And while specific solutions and responses may not always translate well from one country or cultural setting to another, we can nevertheless seek to improve awareness and understanding of our common problems as we work collectively toward our universal goals. I look forward to learning more from you about the substance of your conversations that carry forward from this conference. I know you do and will have much to share. Thank you once more for this incredible opportunity to address you today 
and for your kind attention to my comments about our role and responsibility as women lawmakers to lift up the voices, visions, and values of our mothers, our sisters, and our daughters in our regions and in our countries and in every continent of this world. Your work inspires me. You inspire me. I am instantly transported back in time to my first and so far only visit to your country and to a farewell dinner held to commemorate the exchange of ideas, experiences, and concerns of women by women, legislators from America and parliamentarians from South Africa. At the conclusion of the evening meal, the speaker rose as if to offer a toast or a speech. Instead, she spoke a few words in her mother tongue and she began to sing a jubilant, rhythmic tune. And in unison, the women parliamentarians quickly stood and responded to the speaker in kind with ethereal harmonies. And then they all began to dance. We Americans sat enraptured at first, but soon understood that we had received an invitation to participate in the festivity and we joined enthusiastically and joyfully for the remainder of the night. This image too is permanently etched in my mind and on my heart as symbolic of our global sisterhood, yours and mine, beautiful and alive, a sisterhood that transcends language, that is welcoming and filled with hope, optimism, and love. It was one of the most memorable moments of my life and a gift I will always cherish. Thank you. I wish you well, my sisters, in your deliberations ahead. Thank you very much, um, Representative Santos. I had to take a big swallow there. I'm going to immediately call up Honorable Deirdre Bartman to give her vote of thanks to Representative Santos. Please may I ask that um, our guests switch off their cameras um, Ms. Michelia, if you can switch your camera off, please, um, for the sake of the streaming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. As Chair of the Budget Committee and the recent journey our committee in the Western Cape has embarked upon in order to essentially review our budget cycle to strengthen oversight and public participation through the use of legislative mechanisms, I've been asked to provide the vote of thanks to Representative Sharon Santos. I would firstly like to thank Representative Santos for her address today. It has been moving and inspiring. Her advocacy for the provision of quality early learning programs, a well-trained educator workforce, and closing the gap is testimony to her dedication towards women's rights and the advancement thereof. I wholeheartedly agree with Representative Santos' statement that we need to wholeheartedly have the participation of women within our respective economies, and that this requires what she classified as a unified movement based on the cacophony of sisterhood. It is time that our governments and our treasury departments put their money where their mouths are. And your presence and participation in this conference is much appreciated. And we look forward to the use of your guidance and lessons received today to continue the fight towards gender equality within our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bartman. Much appreciated. And uh, once again, a big thank you to Representative Santos. Before we continue, can I just ask that those members that are online um, and guests who have not yet in the chat function indicated 
which breakaway group they would like to be on, if they could do so now as we get closer and closer to the breakaway sessions. I'd like to move on to the program and welcome the Minister of Social Development, Ms. Uh, member, Honourable Member Shana Fernandes. Um, she was appointed to her current role in 2019. Um, Honourable Member Fernandes has served as Speaker of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament from 2014 to 2019. And prior to her political career, she enjoyed a 30-year career in three of South Africa's four largest banks. In August of 2009, she, was, uh, she fell ill and with H1N1, which forced her into early retirement in order to restore her health. Her recovery period took almost three years. And once she regained her strength, she started doing community work and became actively involved in civic matters by serving as chairperson of the local neighborhood watch and participating in various community structures. During her tenure as Speaker of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, she served as the Rules Committee Chairperson, as well as Chairperson of the Western Cape Branch of the Commonwealth Women's Parliament. She is passionate about people and serving others. Her personal values, such as honesty and integrity, are deeply entrenched. She is outspoken about human rights and women's rights and tackling the scourge of substance abuse. As the lead provincial minister for gender-based violence in the Western Cape and a survivor of gender-based violence herself, Ms. Fernandes leads with a kind heart and a strong mind. I welcome Minister Shana Fernandes. If I could just ask that other members switch their cameras off. Thank you very much. Over to Good you. Good morning, Honourable Deputy Speaker. Am I audible? You are audible. Thanks, Minister. Thank you to the Honourable Premier or Honourable Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, the Honourable Members of this August House and other provincial legislatures in South Africa, civil society organisations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I greet all the attendees in peace. Honourable Deputy Speaker, Placing the dignity and innate rights of women in the spotlight is almost impossible to discuss without acknowledging that gender inequality and patriarchy remain critical challenges that threaten the progress of living in a society that is just. The year 2020 marked the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action and was intended to be a groundbreaking initiative for gender equality. Instead, a recent policy brief of the United Nations looking at the impact of COVID on women and with the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, indications are that the limited gains made in the past decades are at risk of being rolled back. The pandemic is deepening pre-existing inequalities and exposing the vulnerabilities in social, political, and economic systems, which are in turn amplifying the impacts of the pandemic. Across every sphere, from health to the economy, security to social protection, the impacts of COVID-19 are exacerbated for women and girls simply by virtue of their sex. Compounded economic impacts are felt especially by women and girls who are generally earning less, saving less, and holding insecure jobs or living close to poverty. Unpaid care work has increased, with children being out of school, heightened care needs of older persons, and overwhelmed health care services. As the COVID-19 pandemic deepened, economic social stress, coupled with restricted movement and social Social isolation measures saw gender-based violence increasing exponentially. Many women are being forced to lock down at home with their abusers at the same time that services, support services and support to survivors are being disrupted and made inaccessible in some instances. As women take on greater care demands at home, their jobs will also be disproportionately affected 
by cuts and layoffs. One such sector being the early childhood development sector, which was virtually decimated by the hard lockdown in South Africa in 2020. Such impacts, Deputy Speaker, risk rolling back the already fragile gains made in female labor force participation, limiting women's ability to support themselves and their families, especially for female headed households. In many countries, the first round of layoffs, in many countries, the first round of layoffs has been particularly acute in the services sector, including retail, hospitality, and the restaurant and tourism industry, where women are overrepresented. The situation is worse in developing economies where the vast majority of women's employment, nearly 70%, is in the informal e economy, with few protections against dismissal or for paid sick leave. To earn a living, these workers often depend on public spaces and social interactions, which are now being restricted to contain the spread of the pandemic. Honorable Deputy Speaker, as legislatures, government officials and individuals who have a seat at the table, the decision making table, we owe it to every woman on this platform and in society to bring the challenges and injustices facing women squarely into the public domain, as well as ensuring that decisions are made through a gender lens and that the voices and concerns of women are considered and embedded in the policy making process. Honorable Deputy Speaker, everything we do during and after the COVID-19 crisis must aim to build more equal, inclusive, and sustainable economies and societies. This is perhaps the clearest lesson emerging from the pandemic. This include gender responsive economic and social policies and placing women's economic lives at the heart of the pandemic response and recovery plans. Beyond this, the whole range of economic policies for both immediate response and long-term recovery need to be designed and implemented with a gender lens. This includes the removal of barriers that prevent full involvement of women in economic activities, equal pay and equal opportunities, financing for women entrepreneurs and mechanisms to promote women's self-employment. Such economic responses would include both the public and private sectors. Equally, narrowing gender-based education gaps and ensuring women remain in and, ex and expand their participation in the formal labor market will play a significant role in providing many economies with the capacity to rebound with stronger, more equitable and sustainable growth. The COVID-19 global crisis has made starkly visible the fact that the world's formal economies and the maintenance of our daily lives are built on the invisible and unpaid labor of women and girls. With children out of school, intensified care needs of older persons and ill family members, and an overwhelmed health service, the, the demands for care work in COVID-19 world have intensified exponentially. And the unpaid care economy is therefore a critical mainstay of the COVID-19 response. Honorable Deputy Speaker, there are gross imbalances in the gender distribution of unpaid care work. Before COVID-19 became a universal or global pandemic, women were doing three times as much unpaid work as men and domestic work as men. And this unseen economy has real impacts on the formal economy and women's lives. In the context of the pandemic, the increased demand for care work is deepening already existing inequalities in the gender division of labor. The less visible parts of the care economy are coming under increasing strain, but remain unaccounted for in the economic response. Honorable Deputy Speaker, placing, girls, placing women and girls at the center of economies will fundamentally drive 
better and more sustainable development outcomes for all. It will support a more rapid recovery and place us back on track to achieve the sustainable development goals. Honourable Deputy Speaker, we need to be both intentional and practical in addressing gender equality or inequality, especially during this COVID pandemic. And some key aspects of the work that we are seized with as the Western Cape government include, but are not limited to, a citizen-focused recovery plan that is underpinned by four key pillars. The first key pillar is our COVID health response, which is spearheaded by the Honourable Minister Mbombo, who will be addressing this platform. The other three pillars are jobs, safety, and well-being and dignity, which has expanded to include an interministerial faith-based organization forum, and more recently, the establishment of a forum to focus on the issues of mental health, which is emerging globally as the next focus area. As a government, we have adopted a 365-day focus on gender-based violence. As the Minister tasked to lead gender-based violence in the province, we have established an internal transversal GBV forum where every department is represented by a gender champion. The role of the forum is to create awareness and facilitate an understanding of gender, gender equality, gender equity and gender-based violence amongst others in an effort to shift behaviour and the culture within government. We will also be focusing on the elimination of violence and harassment in the world of work as per convention number one, number 190 of the International Labour Convention. Deputy Speaker, I'm also proud to announce that next Friday, the 20th of August, we will be launching a series of webinars titled Courageous Conversations, and our very first webinar will be led by our Premier, Alan Windy, who is a firm proponent for women's rights. And I am extremely pleased to see that we are making, we are starting to create and make that progress that is required to bring our male colleagues, counterparts on board as the fight for gender equality and, and the goal includes both men and women. Honourable Deputy Speaker, in closing, if we are to address the injustices faced by women in South African society and globally, we are all required to contribute. Whatever role you play and wherever you find yourself, a member of a family, a leader in your community, a holder of public office, you must make every effort to promote the rights and dignity of all individuals, but especially those of women. We all need to be united in placing the dignity and innate rights of women in the spotlight. And the COVID-19 pandemic allows us the opportunity to reset our moral compass globally and to focus on building a just society. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Fernandes. If you won't mind that we will give your vote of thanks after Minister Mbombo. Um, because we do know that you will be online. Thank you very much for your time. Um, we now move over to uh, Dr. Norma French Mbombo, who was born and bred in Matsane Township in East London, the Eastern Cape, South Africa. She's currently the Western Cape Health Minister, having assumed the position on January 2015, the first female ever appointed in this position in this department. Before being appointed as the health minister, she was the minister at the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sports. She is a mother, a human rights activist, and a nature lover. Before entering into politics, Dr. Mbombo was an associate professor at the Faculty of Community and Health Sciences in the University of the Western Cape, South Africa. She holds a PhD in the area of gender and human rights, a master's in maternal and child health, and a bachelor's in nursing science. She previously worked in provincial and local government health uh, departments in the Eastern Cape and KZN respectively. Dr Mbombo has held advisory and consultative roles to various ministries of health in Africa 
and in a multinational, in various multinational organizations across the globe. Her area of interest and closer to her heart is community empowerment as agency to reclaim the voices of the populations at risk, such as young women, girls, rural women, and minority groups. And she lives with her life mantra, where I am planted, I grow. I welcome Minister Norma French Mbombo. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks a lot uh, to uh, other speakers uh, who have uh, already spoken. Special welcome and also appreciation uh, from the from Honorable Khan, International Chairperson for Commonwealth Parliamentarians, Honorable Gimba uh, from the Africa region, and also all other speakers um, uh, uh, that I need to acknowledge, including my colleague from the Social De uh, Development. Speaker, uh, Deputy Speaker, as you were um, introducing my CV, I realized that uh, I've got an option to use my other cap as a former academic where I can just make this session academic and then we ended up being, uh, being lectured. Or I can use my other cap as an activist, uh, a person who has been fighting, uh, um, I mean, for the issues of women and empowerment, uh, where not only uh, in, in the Western Cape or in South Africa, but in the whole of Africa, uh, international, I've got that option. Oh, the last option is about where I wear my cap as a, a minister, a provincial minister of health and share some of the, um, the practices. So speaker, allow me to deviate uh, from my paper, which was, um, uh, I put some input just to talk because I won't be able to come back in the breakaway sessions but I don't want to leave some of the important aspects within it. So I'm standing here as a legislator. So how we can be able to influence policy and also in terms of how to influence also the legislation across, because uh, as I indicated, we have been protesting, trying to come up with the solutions. We have been writing papers about these. There are papers there and also thanks um, uh, to some people who pave way, especially uh, in the UN and other contributions. We have been sponsoring some of these um, aside kind of the debates within the UN. So today, now speaker, I want to wear my cap as a legislator, but using health part of my experience going forward. I acknowledge and uh, the placing the dignity and innate rights of women in the spotlight, uh, it comes at a crucial time when we are grappling and juggling with a pandemic and also a pandemic of the COVID, in addition to some of the pandemics that we used to have, which are still with us, which is the gender-based violence. And I'm excited to see sub themes related to the gender gap parity, uh, women in science, technology, engineering, and also mathematics, uh, pursuing those kind of the areas, probably also must add climate change, and also about the gender responsive budgeting. These are very crucial. Now, let me indicate in terms of why these are the crucial from the perspective of the health, using the current situation of the COVID pandemic, which is affecting the whole world. For us, we learned a lesson that this is not only about the lives as health that we need uh, to save, but also the livelihoods. Why, Deputy Speaker? It's because we do know that what we see as a health problem, not only in regard to the COVID, but it's about the upstream factors where the social determinants of health that are beyond um, being managed by health, but also needs to be managed elsewhere. That means the whole of society, the whole of government, the whole of the departments. So you cannot be able to create binaries because between um, the, the lives and livelihoods, which is the health and also about the economy. So it talks to, when we talk about uh, one aspect uh, of the sub theme, gender responsive budgeting, it makes us to realize, Speaker, that currently now, whilst our budgeting has been more skewed in regard to some uh, fewer of the diseases like HIV AIDS at the time when it started in the 80s, 90s, it made not only South Africa, not only Western Cape, but countries throughout the world, specifically in African context and also in the parts of the Asia, 
where HIV AIDS has had a huge impact, to use uh, uh, budgeting in regard to prioritizing some of those in regard to the risk factors. So going forward, Speaker, in the breakaway groups, let's also use the COVID as part of the budget, the response agenda, responsive budgeting, so that it filters in because COVID, the face of the COVID is the socioeconomic ills. It's no longer about a health problem. We have seen how COVID has impacted on women. Not only are the ones who are mostly infected, but also in regard on how the social and socioeconomic ills, um, in terms of the challenges related to the poverty, inequality, and also unemployment. We have seen that how the most jobs that have been at risk, that have been lost, and the livelihoods that have been lost are the ones where we find that it's mostly the women who are participating. We cannot uh, I mean, talk enough about, because it's obvious it's there, about how the health and the wealth become twins. When you have no access to food, and not even talk about the nutritious food, because that one is a luxury, to food, we do know how it impacts on your health. When you have been a millionaire or you have had access, and then you ended up losing the businesses or even, even losing the jobs, whilst previously you had, in short, we in short, you had medical aid to access the private. You end up not having any other options. It means that you will end up joining and clocking the health system. It does impact on us. So what COVID shows us that it impacts on you on whatever social class or whatever race, but specifically mostly around the women because not only about the jobs uh, in regard to the women's space, but also in regard to women as carers. 10 days isolation or quarantine, where it's, be, it's where you find that um, in most instances that these people have to be cared for by women, uh, cared for at home, the majority of the people who have to do that are the women. So we're talking about women who might not necessarily be positive, but as a head of household, but because also in terms of the gender constructive aspect is that uh, by default position, they are the ones who have to be caring for the female uh, family members, be it your own parents, be it your own family, biological family, plus also your in-laws, uh, the sister of the sister, my sister-in-law, even the neighbors. It meant that you ended up even uh, putting yourself at risk because you'll be caring about other people who are positive and yet who are not positive. Also, Speaker, in regard to also to the to this part of it, uh, um, in regard to the the gender gap parity, in regard to health, in as much as that in health by default, anywhere I'm talking now as an employer, uh, as a sector, we find that the majority of the healthcare professionals are women. <laughs> Um, the nurses and the doctors, even in the Western Cape, actually in this department, we have about almost 68 percent. It's a female led, <laughs> including myself, who is a female. So it's a female led kind of. But it, you must just zoom in regard um, to the different professional categories. For example, uh, the majority of the healthcare professionals are nurses, which are actually uh, mostly women. But you look in terms of how the system, which has always been there, and it is my profession, by the way, we will find that the issue of the um, not only the resources, not only the working conditions, but also in regard to the salaries and the payment, where they've always been left behind. Yet it takes about four years, not only to educate at the university, plus also even the training of the, for example, of the nurses. And also take into consideration the majority of the healthcare workers in the whole of South Africa who have been infected actually are mostly those in the, um, the healthcare workers, those who are nurses, we are the majority, even the females, which have been infected. But having said, uh, speak about the gender gap, but I also want to talk about the STEM. Yes, indeed, as I indicated that they, um, we have had uh, many of those who have been tapping the space as the women. But if you look in terms of up to the level of the seniority in regard to managing uh, the units and all of those, but you find that it just changes uh, completely where you'll find that uh, mostly um, uh, other men. So going forward, Speaker, is about for us, because it's a, a most of our uh, employers are women. We have had same, many other um, uh, uh, platforms and also interventions 
to ensure that we are accommodative in regard to have the um, the gender mainstreaming as part of what we do. Uh, even when at the time in regard to who's supposed to work at home, you need to understand that when the schools are closed, ECDs are closed, and then you are a woman who will be working uh, there at home, you will now understand that there will be times where you have to provide that space that probably maybe is assisting the little one to eat porridge. Or you can understand why now there's a quite a lot of noise. Bro, it's that time where everyone now maybe it's about time, lunchtime and all of those. So those things has to be up, uh, um, accommodative. But we also have piggyback in regard to our strength because we have got quite a large number of science scientists who are even women. Um, hence, we have used so much of the evidence. Actually, um, in South Africa, the people who have been the trendsetters in regard to the vaccination program, when we started to vaccinate healthcare workers, uh, were the professors, um, Professor Glenda Gray, and also in the context of South Africa, uh, Professor um, uh, um, Linda Gale, uh, who have been pioneering as women, uh, as, a, as a scientist on their own right. So as we have been able to use evidence and also to use uh, data to lead us, and also currently now we are on the third wave, we are peggy picking on those programs. Lastly, speaker, I want to speak about the vaccination problem, in, uh, vaccination in regard to not leaving anyone behind. Because for us, the notion of not leaving anyone behind, it was to ensure that we don't leave those vulnerable, and most of them are the women. Hence, you'll find that in some cases, we will have pop-up buses of the vaccination site that are outside the mainstream, so that we could be able to accommodate um, those women who are mostly like in the farming communities or in the informal settlements. And also to use um, that opportunity when women are shopping, because at the end of the month or they're having their social grants or child social grants and pension payouts and all of those, you know that they'll be buying food at the grocery store. So instead of now having the vaccination sites outside uh, where women could be able to access them, we bring them to the shopping malls so that they could be able uh, to have so such access. So Deputy Speaker, in closing, I want to indicate that with health, in as much as that in the health system, the majority are the women and that it makes the, us to benefit gender wise because you have that gender equality balancing that there are many women. And also economy wise, because the women are mostly the head of the households, Therefore, when they are employed, which is guaranteed, not only healthcare professionals, but even the lower levels, such as the community health workers, we will find that they are still there. Some of them not even have been exposed to the higher education. What are the ones who are the high employer sector in that regard? Similar with the cleaning, uh, with the, all other categories of the healthcare workers in administratively that we acknowledge. However, as health, we have to absorb as many of the inequalities as many of the poverty, as many of the other challenges related to the poverty within our system. So whilst other sectors might be able to turn a blind eye or choose who to respond to, but when everything fails, everything comes to help. Hence for us, we do contribute on the gender balancing in regard to that space, just like we contribute in regard to the women accessing science, technology, and all of those. However, it does have a psychological impact to us as healthcare workers, as women, plus also as healthcare workers, majority are women. Currently with the COVID, of which the face of the COVID um, is no longer now only about the health problem, but is a woman who's unemployed, who is hungry, who also has got the inequalities, as we know, lastly, with the inequalities that contribute, uh, inequalities of gender, contribute to gender-based violence. Inequalities related to the class contribute to the crime that is related to, to uh, housebreaking and all of those that may, women end up being impacted. Inequalities related to the age, that's when we see our children being raped uh, by their fathers, by their uncles and so forth. And all of this come to us, uh, to women. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I wish every luck um, and also um, everything to go smoothly. And state speaker, lastly, I wouldn't want this to end because I'm saying that I'm wearing my cap as a legislator. We we'll want us to see this happening, whether next week where we could be able to, uh, all of us in this legislature, specifically in the Western Cape, to say that we have done it. 
we've gone beyond top shopping, but now that's what we're submitting to do it for South Africa as well. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very, you much, very much, much, Mr. Mbombo. I'd like to call on um, Honourable Member Ayanda Barnes to give the vote of thanks to our two ministers. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And greetings to you, greetings to everyone that can hear me, the phenomenal woman. I think I've been given the most easy task here uh, to thank one of my own, in fact, two of my own. When I was thinking what I was going to say next, I realized that actually this is the easy one because it's of what of our own um, matters that they raised even today are matters that we normally speak to about and address. Um, as Minister Mbombo said at the last latter part that the only wish is for us to move forward and not be the end of it today. How do we move forward? They didn't drop the ball. I must say thank you both uh, MECs that are present here today. At a short space of notice, I must say you've done a good job. You've addressed issues. Uniquely, I would always uh, relate to them in different ways. For example, Minister Mbombo disappointed me today. I was expecting to hear for, about the Antisara. Uh, what Antisara is doing in the rural areas, that's how we related to each other. I didn't hear anything about Antisara today, but I think I have only two minutes, but uh, for every woman to know, Antisara in our Western Cape Parliament is that rural woman that we are talking about. And today, Minister Mbombo didn't say anything about Antisara. My wish is for us to take the Antisara and the, uh, the Antishahida from somewhere in the Cape Flats and have, start starting to have conversations. How do we integrate them? Minister Fernandez on the other side, one thing that I know that I didn't read about her from the biography is the love she had for children. I didn't see anything written about that. Like I said, the way we relate to each other in, in different ways. One thing I also know about her is that whenever you would call, she would make sure any woman had a household where there's a female and she's a single parent, there must be food, there must be something to eat for children. I would want to thank them for their time that they are putting together. It doesn't matter how we go heads on, but at the end of the day, we have proven that as women of this parliament, we can relate and we have one agenda, which is women. Lastly, when I'm about to conclude, the only thing that I think that is outstanding that we also need to do is to bring on board our staff members that are women. They also need to voice out. This is their opportunity. I think we are doing well as the social cluster. We have set the standard being a rural with Auntie Sarah, be it whatever that's Auntie Shahida, we have done well, even with the child-headed households. I thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chairperson, Speaker. Thank you very much, Honourable Barnes. Thank you to our ministers. And I'd thank also you. like to acknowledge um, Minister Anru Murray, who is the Minister of, um, of Arts and Culture, as well as Minister Debbie Schaefer, who will be joining us on the breakaway, who is the Minister of Education. So I'm really thank you to the executive who make time out of their incredibly busy schedule to be able to participate. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, to all our participants, uh, we now uh, are going to be moving on to the uh, breakaway sessions. If I could just give you a little bit of, of information, all participants that have registered their interest in respect of their breakaway sessions, the support officials will initiate the process and all participants will be automatically moved. So you won't have to do anything. You'll be automatically moved to your respective groups. This may take a few seconds to complete, so just wait and uh, that, that should happen quite quickly. Once you are in your respective breakaway sessions, the Honourable Members Philander, they will introduce themselves, Honourable Philander, Honourable Maseko and Bakubaku Force will chair the discussions. In fact, I think it's not Honourable Maseko, I think it's Honourable uh, Bartman, um, if I'm correct. That's correct. Um, and then you have 50 minutes for this part of the program. 40 minutes of it will be the deliberation and 10 minutes will be for formulating your report back input. We have IT staff as well as scribes in each of the breakaway sessions to be able to assist the chairperson. Five minutes prior to the end of the session, a warning will appear on the screen prompting you to wrap up and then you will be automatically moved back to the main session. The officials will now initiate the breakaway session. Good luck and I'm looking forward to the outcome.
My name is Wendy Freelander and I'm a member of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament and um, also chairing the Health Standing Committee and um, the Conduct Committee at the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. Um, so once again, from my side, welcome to everyone um, present um, in this uh, session and this um, breakaway group. Um, this is the session for the gender pay gap. Um, as women um, in positions of influence, um, it is incumbent upon us all to strive to implement the necessary change that we are talking about and have extensively talked about um, during the session. It is, however, disappointing that a gender pay gap even exists at a time and as we as South Africans have still a lot of work to do. We have a responsibility to ensure that from a fairness perspective, that our policies as government spheres aims to reduce and to eliminate that gap. Um, it does boil down to the simplicity of equal work for equal pay and the factors that surrounds that. Regardless of pieces of legislation that aimed at preventing gender discrimination in the workplace, the country still has a stagnant median gender pay gap of between 23 and 35 percent in South Africa is ranked first on the Africa Gender Equality Index and globally South Africa is ranked 19th amongst 149 countries on the Gender Gap Index. The details obviously and from what we have also gathered this morning tells us another story and the true reflection is that South African women's economic empowerment is indeed very troubling. In South Africa, around 38% of households are headed by women. Female-headed households are approximately 40% poorer than those that are headed by men. Indeed, this is ridiculous, it's disrespectful, and just plain unacceptable. As women with influence, it is upon us to ensure that the rights of women everywhere are respected, that it's protected, that the rights of women are valued and that it is realized. I am calling on you as participants this morning that during these deliberations today to help plant the seed of change for our adolescent girls in South Africa. As mentioned by the presiding officer in our session of 40 minutes, um, the discussion and the deliberations um, that we will have, participants will have the opportunity um, to deliberate and to conclude on three main parts of this um, gender um, or rather gap in um, remuneration. First of all, the extent of the gender pay gap and the impact that it has on women. Now, roughly dividing our 40 minutes, we will afford um, 30 minutes to that specific subject, 13 minutes. Um, secondly, the main um, contributing factors to the gender pay gap as well as um, the third factor, which, um, which is ways in which the gender pay gap can be addressed. After which then we will spend 10 minutes on compiling our final report in order to provide our feedback. Um, the extent um, of the gender pay gap, I really do um, believe that participants has been provided with the necessary information, so I do not wish to take up too much time um, in the briefing as such. Um, so can I perhaps just have an indication if members wish me to take you through the entire briefing, or can I um, trust that you have uh, familiarized yourself and we can immediately go over to deliberations. Can I perhaps just have an indication of that? Honorable Wenger. Thank you, Chair. Um, perhaps we could just do a high-level summary uh, just to get us off on the right foot. Thank you very much. We can indeed do so. Just give me a minute. There we go. So the extent of the gender pay gap and the impact that it has on women speaks to um, how is it that we measure gender um, inequality. So the gender pay gap is a subset theme of the broader theme 
of gender inequality. And as such, the report firstly discusses briefly the World Economic Forum's criteria as to how it is determined um, in respect of the extent of gender inequality of countries and then obviously by extension of the world, but as we will be speaking specifically to South Africa. Um, the WF Global Gender Gap Framework makes, also makes use of four fundamental categories, which is referred to indexes to measure gender inequality. And these four are women economic participation and opportunity. It speaks to education attainment. It speaks to health and survival and it speaks to political empowerment. The World Economic Forum tracks these, tracks these indexes and gorgeous progress towards closing the gender-based gaps over time to benchmark inequality and provide comparisons across regions and across countries. In measuring these gender pay gaps, it is broadly defined as the difference in the average wages that is paid to women compared to wages paid to men. And various measures are used to determine and to calculate the extent of the gender pay gap. Africa's um, gender pay gap speaks to, um, based on the ILO's 2018 and 2019 estimates, that indicates that women in South Africa were on average paid approximately 30% less than men, while South African median gender pay gap is estimated between 23 and 35%, as mentioned earlier on. The public sector has also contributed in narrowing South Africa's gender pay gap, with more women being employed in the public sector than men, as well as above average wage growth within the sector. When one speaks to the impact that the gender pay gap has, female-headed households are approximately 40% poorer, as also mentioned, than those that are headed by men, but bear the financial burden of supporting more children and extended family members than male-headed households. Women at the top level of the wage distribution experience the grass, or rather the glass ceiling effect, a reference to the barriers that prevent highly qualified women from advancing to senior positions and the top ranks of management within organizations. And what are the main co contributing factors to the gender pay gap? It is documented as a lack of change in industry and um, occupation composition, unpaid care work and domestic work, as was also highlighted earlier on by one of our speakers, the characteristic and the culture of the corporate sector, unequal pay for work of equal value, and the introduction of the national or rather the national minimum wage. And how should one be or rather go about in addressing the gender pay gap? South Africa has a progressive legislative framework that supports equal pay for equal work, encapsulated and embodied within our Employment Equity Act. A current non-legislative intervention is, was by the King for Report on Good Governance, a corporate governance framework which provides voluntary guidelines for promoting fair remuneration and transparency within corporate governance. There's also, um, colleagues recommended mechanisms to improve the effectiveness of the mandatory legislative and the voluntary non-legislative interventions, such as the refinement of the Employment Equity Act um, and robustness. Colleagues, I have quite a few um, notes to still go through, but let me just um, capture in order for us to get the conversation going. So women are paid less than men in many developed and um, developing countries, which is obviously known as the gender pay gap and the discrepancy in remuneration, which is an important and pertinent indicator of gender inequality and the fact that we as women still live, live up till today 
in an unequal and an unfair society. The fundamental issue of equal remuneration that should exist for both women and for men, the discussion will stem obviously then from equal remuneration and the, ex the extent of South Africa's um, gender pay gap and how women are impacted because of that factor. What are the main contributing factors, how this problem can be addressed and who should address this problem? As mentioned, our, we will limit our discussion to what is relevant to us at this point in time. So colleagues, um, our, in based on our theme, placing the dignity and inner rights of women in the spotlight, the report is to discuss the gender pay gap um, in, in mainly three parts, um, which is the extent of which the gender pay gap and the impact that it has on women today. Also the main contributing factors um, to gender pay, what contributes to that the current situation um, still exists and how do we address um, that challenge of gender pay? pay gap. I hope that this brief introduction to the subject could have provided with you, could have provided you um, with the necessary uh, background. I trust that you find that in order and that we can then immediately uh, go over and proceed with our deliberations in this regard. Can I ask that uh, participants just by a show of hand, indicate um, whether they want to speak to this um, matter. I see just one moment. Ms. Um, you must just assist me if I, I hope I pronounce your um, surname correctly. Is it um, Germanos? It's Germanos, so it's not too far off. Germanos. My apologies. Thank, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Um, I, I actually found um, the findings in this research paper quite interesting, and I think um, the most interesting of the findings is that the top level of the wage distribution, um, that gap has continued to widen in South Africa. So in other words, women who want to go into senior positions or management positions, there are less of them there. Um, I didn't find that surprising, and I'll explain why. And I actually specifically want to speak to the one of the factors that were raised for this um, pay discrepancy, which is the characteristic and culture of the corporate sector, which I think plays a huge role um, in the reason why this gap continues to widen. And I'll speak from my perspective as a legal professional. Um, what I see the issue to be is that corporate South Africa and probably the global corporate sector is a male. And probably more specifically, it's a, it's a white man. So that's its persona and that's its character. And um, that, that character, this masculine character is quite unforgiving. Um, it's become a lot more impatient over time. So the corporate sector has now got very high turnaround times um, for output. Um, and um, in the legal profession, if you are at capacity and you turn down a brief, you're likely never to be briefed again. Um, and that's the harsh reality of those sectors. So in as much as women have been emancipated now for decades, um, these sectors have never truly welcomed or accommodated us as women because they maintain their very masculine persona. And by that, I mean, they see personal responsibilities as a conflicting interest to professional responsibilities. And we know among us that women carry most of the profession, I mean, personal responsibility burden. That means unpaid and undervalued domestic and care work. Um, and that doesn't really matter if you're a professional or not, you're always going to have that burden in addition. And those sectors view it very much as um, a weakness. So if you can't attend a meeting because you have to pick up a child or you have to take time off because you've had one or you're pregnant, that puts you at a major disadvantage as a female professional. And in the recent past, I have had two people, one being my one of my very close friends, leave the legal profession because um, they've just had a baby 
Or in another instance, somebody who has been in the legal profession for 10 years left it because she felt that she had missed out on the first 10 years of her daughter's life. And in this, so what I'm trying to say is in as much as there are no visible barriers to women in the corporate sector, we are inadvertently excluded because we're not accommodated. And for as long as that continues, for as long as there is no um, very targeted policies and solutions to change the perception around personal responsibilities in the corporate sector, we will continue to have this widening gap in uh, the top level wage distribution. And for as long as the corporate sector doesn't see personal responsibilities as a way of um, optimizing your professional performance. If you take care of your personal life, your professional life is then likely to also, um, you, you're likely to improve at your, or rather perform at your best. Um, for as long as that perception doesn't change, I think we'll continue to have this widening gap. And that's that's just my pick. Thank you very much for your valuable input. I recognize Honorable Wenger. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to get the right background on here. There we go. Right. Thank you very much. Um, um, I agree with uh, the previous speaker. There are um, these invisible barriers that create the, the wage gap. Um, in preparing for this, um, the United Nations woman uh, notes that women are less likely to participate in the labor market than men. Um, they're more likely to be unemployed and globally, when they are employed, are paid less than men. This is mirrored in South Africa, where men are more likely to be in paid employment than women, and this is regardless of race. Um, so we need to understand why is this so and how do we fix it? Um, so to address this, we need to consider what restricts women's access to the labor market and to participation, um, and what, uh, what form do these restrictions take. You know, sometimes it's social norms, such as family expectations that um, Mr. Manus has just spoken about, uh, and that women are disproportionately burdened with domestic and household responsibilities um, and with family support uh, responsibilities that sometimes prevent them from entering the job market. In fact, um, the OECD um, submitted a report um, which said that women spend two to ten times more on unpaid care work than men. And this unequal distribution of caring responsibilities is linked to discriminatory social institutions, stereotypes, and gender roles. Um, and in their view, this gender inequality in unpaid care work is actually the missing link in the analysis of gender pay gaps uh, and labor outcomes and labor force participation by women. So if we can look at what are some of the entrenched gender norms and stereotypes that um, create um, this inequality for women, um, we can then try to understand how do we um, how do we start to fix it? Um, and so what do we do? And so having given quite a lot of thought to it, um, I'd like to table three proposals then. The one is um, opening the workspace for flexi time and flexi space. And I think this is one advantage that the COVID pandemic has brought about, which is the um, um, the flexi time and flexi space dynamic, which I think is probably advanced by about a decade um, because we were forced to do it. But if companies and employers uh, are open to flexi time and flexi space, it does give women the opportunity to better balance um, their responsibilities that they find at home, but still be able to be active participants in the labor force. Then um, I would like to table a proposal um, for the National Assembly or through the National Council of Provinces that South Africa amends its marriage regime. Our default marriage regime is that of community of property. And I, I honestly don't understand why this is still in place and this hasn't been changed. So what it means is that spouses' assets and liabilities are joined together and they are equal concurrent uh, managers of their joint estate. However, we know that in a patriarchal society, um, 
it is very difficult for women to gain access to credit to be able to start their own businesses if they need their husband's permission. Um, so if we were to change the marriage regime, um, which would allow for greater financial independence of women, then that is certainly something that we as lawmakers can and should do. And then my third and final proposal is um, possibly more complex, but I think it's something that we should uh, still have a look at. Um, let me just find my notes. I've got two, actually. The one is to look at the creation of a working mom's child care grant. So we know that women are often discouraged from um, accessing the job market because the costs of childcare can really be prohibitive. We know it's very expensive and you know you don't feel comfortable to leave your child um, anywhere. You want to make sure that they have a good quality of care. So um, if we could establish a grant for working mothers who earn less than a certain amount um, per month, um, it would then assist those women to place those ch ch the, her children or child into good quality childcare while she is at work. So that means then that A, she can afford to work and B, children are placed in good quality aftercare. Uh, and then, then now this is my final proposal is to improve the financial literacy and access to skills development on digital platforms for women so that women can make decisions um, uh, independently and have the financial literacy to access cheap and easy banking platforms. Um, as you know, um, the more digital, the less expensive. Um, and so if we can help um, women, um, you know, to, to have access to financial literacy courses, as well as digital banking platforms, I think that would go a long way to assisting women to become financially independent, which of course all, all links in with then the wage gap. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honourable Wenger, for um, your valuable input, but as well as your um, proposals put forward. At this point, perhaps, if I can just go back to um, Ms. Germanos, is there perhaps a proposal that you would like to put forward at this stage? Uh, thank you very much. Honourable Philander, so um, there is a proposal and I'd also just like to address um, two of the proposals put forward by Honourable Wenger. Um, she, men she mentioned that changing the default um, uh, marital property regime might assist women um, uh, because the default is currently marriage and community of property. I'm not sure that that is a good solution and I'll explain myself. Um, there's a double-edged sword with that. Uh, what we've um, I was previously a constitutional court law clerk, um, and I sat in on a matter which has um, now currently been handed down. It's Sitole versus Sitole. Um, this uh, case actually dealt with the fact that in the old um, Black Marriages Act, Black women um, were automatic, automatically married out of community of property. And this caused quite a big issue to today, because when poor women split from their husbands, they're often left with nothing because they are married out of community of property. Um, and it offers them actually quite a lot less protection. Um, a way out of obviously being married in community of property, if for example, you want to get credit without having to also get the permission or added signature of your husband is to voluntarily elect to be married in a different marital regime. Um, so I'm not sure that changing the default um, marital regime is necessarily the answer. Um, and then with the flexi uh, working hours or flexi space, um, I've seen in COVID, um, and I can speak for myself, that the flexi um, hours or space are not as flexi as we think they are. The work from home um, has actually, in my experience, resulted in a lot of um, crossed barriers. So there's no longer a line between work and professional life. And I think that has in some cases made it a bit harder for professional women who are working at home and now have their children who they will naturally attend to at any time during the day because they're at home. Um, I think the solution that I would put forward for a change um, in sort of the, the corporate animal that is basically a male persona is very targeted or a push for targeted policies, um, maybe in the form of like a, I don't know, a King Seven um, 
framework on corporate governance is um, targeted policies within corporates where um, there is it's aimed at shifting the perception around personal responsibilities, placing a value on um, domestic and care work uh, for their professional staff and um, sort of really pushing to no longer have it seen as a competing um, responsibility with your professional responsibilities. So uh, a bigger push to genuinely accommodate um, personal responsibilities. And this would include things like having a hard stop um, at a particular hour, like you no longer are allowed to send emails after seven o'clock or eight o'clock. In the legal profession, you send emails around the clock and the later you send it um, sort of into the night and into the early hours of the morning, the more it's understood that you're a diligent, hardworking professional. And I think that culture has to shift. And the only way you probably could do that is by having a hard stop um, at a particular time and um, sort of changing the perception that if you email after the after hours, you, you're a hard worker, but more is um, sort of seeing it as, you know, somebody who's not properly taking care of their personal responsibilities, which should now rather be frowned upon in the corporate space as opposed to lauded. And um, that is a proposal that I would put forward. So thank you for giving me this space. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Um, I recognize Honorable uh, Nkontlo. Honorable Nkontlo. Yes, thank you. Um, oh, apologies, uh, 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 Chair. No Issues problem. Of Issues of eldership and technology. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Um, I must say uh, this is a very interesting uh, 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 conversation, and indeed, um, the, the the research uh, helps us uh, to just understand the extent uh, of this uh, problem. The, the 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 only areas I want uh, perhaps would have to take it further and try and gain more uh, uh, in-depth uh, uh, data on, particularly is in which sectors of the economy uh, do we still experience um, uh, uh, this uh, gender pay gap? Uh, because I think for me, um, also from what was said by our speakers, it's very difficult to change what you cannot see. So it is important that we get to a point where we can exactly be able to say between the public sector and the private sector, which areas, and I think um, I think uh, the, the, the speaker, the previous speaker, just, just mentioned what is happening in the, in the legal profession, which is one area which I think helps us as legislatures to sort of direct, you know, uh, the kind of interventions if we needed to think about probably a legislative um, a sort of intervention or a policy uh, intervention. So I'm just saying, uh, uh, Chair, perhaps we would need to further drill down, especially in the South African context, to be able to identify those sectors of our economy where I think um, this uh, particular challenge is still uh, predominant. Also, I think in one of the pages, uh, it, it does mention, I think, what we see in as far as the discrepancy in remuneration as one, as one area where I think uh, one of the interventions uh, being uh, raised there is actually affecting uh, the, the, the minimum wage to narrow the gender pay gap, uh, gender pay gap particularly at the bottom level. Um, uh, of 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 the of the economy. So I think it's it's one of those things that are already there, and then it means we as legislatures we need then you know through this um, uh, 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 women parliament to consider how can we play our role to sort of advocate uh, for such. In, in, in our own spaces so that at least from today onwards into the next um, um, uh, women parliament, we can start seeing whether the 
is progress, you know, from something and information that has been brought to the fore through research wherein we can be able to sort of um, a, a make an impact. So for me, I think these are some of the considerations that we, 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 we need to look at. Whilst it is said we have moved ahead, and especially in South Africa, I think we're number one in the continent, if we look at the political empowerment of women, I think we must also recognize how the political we must recognize how the political environment and political institutions that we as women participate in gets to, they are highly, as it has been said, they are masculine in character. And at times we get to be masculinized ourselves as women. And I think it's one gray area from where I'm sitting that I'm sure perhaps if there is any research, it's something that we must look at. The extent to which the participation of women, our numbers, which actually brings our country, you know, high up in terms of our presence as women, actually shifts um, um, masculinity of the institutions. Because I think as once who sits currently in, in, the, in the current administration, you know, and also in other political spaces, one of the challenges that I think as women, we, all, uh, we always speak about is the level of toxic masculinity in those institutions, which in any way demonstrate how slow is the pace of, yes, the form has changed, but the content remains the same because indeed the characterization or the character of those institutions and even the design. Actually, I remember in one of the women's parliament that we held here in the province in the last administration, one was um, considering how even the design of the sitting of the parliaments that we sit in are not necessarily meant for us as women. You know, they have a particular male that would have been able to sit in if you look at the spaces in between. I'm just making that very simple uh, uh, example. So I'm just saying I think it's one area that we need to consider. And as I try and make my uh, submissions, uh, 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 Honorable uh, Chair of, the, of this session, I would like one, if we could uh, actually as a women's parliament, especially from the NA right to ourselves in all the different legislatures, perhaps it's important to consider um, a yearly uh, focus on these uh, employment equity reports so that on one area that we must be interested in is exactly the extent to which the gender pay gap is shifting whether it's actually there is some kind of a positive change in that regard. So I would think it's one of the things that we are supposed to monitor because this particular report of the Employment Equity Commission must be able uh, to be requested by ourselves in our women's parliament and then we are able to demonstrate whether there is progress or lack thereof so that if there isn't any progress, we can then be able to engage you know, the relevant departments such as the Department of Labor you know, and also engagements with the private sector where possible. The second proposal, Chair, in that, in that regard for me is the extent to which, as a resolution, we can then request the National Department of Women, the Department of Trade and Industry, and the Department of Labor and Employment to sort of uh, consider an engagement both with the private sector and professional bodies around this particular issue of the gender pay, uh, gender pay, pay gap, you know, in those uh, various uh, industries and professional bodies, and be able to sort of um, uh, advocate and promote, you know, some kind of a, a, of a, um, a proposals, you know, from the from the industry on how they would commit, you know, as part of their transformation uh, agenda and part of their uh, corporate governance requirements actually to sort of work on these areas where indeed obviously research would dictate which um, a particular sector is experiencing you know uh, this gender pay cap so i think for me those are the two proposals that i would like to 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 place uh, 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 for, for for this uh, uh, parliament to consider thank you chairperson I thank you very much, um, Arvon Kontlo, for your valuable input and the two um, proposals provided. I now recognize Ms. Arifa Parker. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
I just want to support uh, the proposals that was given by the Chief Whip. And I just wanted to add one more thing to it. We are coming from the business side of things. I would like to encourage corporates actually in some way we must add this eh, to create if they if they we've got talented women out there and many and I've been seeing it as part of an organization that many of these talented women are leaving corporates and big companies and starting them their own. This is fine, but the corporates are missing on something very valuable over here. And I think one of the things that corporates need to think about is helping to create a crash in every corporate or even in small companies, create a crash. And I like the idea that have the grant for the those uh, parents or uh, young women or women who need to have uh, children to look after, but why not transfer it that onto the uh, the company? If the company wants loyalty and if the company wants a big turnout at the bottom line to be increased, then get them to understand that women are of value. Today, many of our young engineering students, and I see that, are being taken away because they are not being allowed or they are not being chosen in their rightful places of their own industries or wherever they need to be uh, used in their talents. This is my input. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your valuable input, um, Ms. Parker. Um, Honorable Wenger, I see your hand. Is that um, second bite to the cherry or is there something you wanted um, to alert um, us to at this point? Um, no, it was, I just wanted to just expand on uh, my proposal about the marriage regime um, when the opportunity arises. Will do. Thank you very much, Honourable Wenger. Um, Honourable Barnes. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, from the information that was submitted to us, I tried to look at the data versus uh, policy, what are we having? And quite actually what we find these days, mostly it's us women that are the reason that we find ourselves being remunerated so much under men because in many yeah, cases you'll find us being in majority, majority or even in senior position. But then at the end of the day, we don't rule within our own favor and it becomes a problem. So I think as women, we should start having conversations with ourselves regarding to how are we going to deal with the matter. Second to that, um, I have tried also to find policy. What is policy actually saying uh, with regards to the matter at hand? And quite honestly, with the documents that I've read, it's a bit subtle. There's no sharp, there's no sharp uh, um, 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 raising of it saying this is how we are going to address it. I think it should start somewhere. And the place to start is where we are. This parliament, this platform, we should start having conversations on how are we influencing the policy to suit ourselves as women. And let us be an example to the rest of the world. Um, my last one would be, except for policy, at times even when we do have the policy, that is reality. The policy is there, it's written. It doesn't get to practice now. I would like to make a recommendation that says, as much as we have policies, we should also put in systems in place that will monitor and evaluate like the same way what we are doing to equity plans and other plans that we are having in the house. Let's have uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, um, um, policies to take care of, of the issues of us in our remuneration because honestly, we are doing hard work as women and I, I, I strongly feel that we are the, our own reason for the setback that we are facing. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much, um, Member Barnes. Your valuable input or your input is valued. I am now going to afford the opportunity to Minister Fernandez and then Honourable Wenger. I will afford you the opportunity to just um, provide a more extent to your um, one of your resolutions. Minister Fernandez. Thank you, um, Honourable Chairperson. My input links in with that of Ms. Sarifa Parker. And um, there are ways we can address the gap that are not necessarily financial, but you might have picked up from my presentation, it's a focus on care. And in my role as the Speaker of Parliament in the fifth term, I had the opportunity to visit three legislatures in Australia. And what struck me at one of the legislatures was the fact that they had a, an ECD facility on board 
for all members where the husbands or the spouses could attend to the babies whilst their wives were in parliament. They had, um, they had facilities for women to express milk and all of these, you know, what we, we would think is um, it's something that's out there. It is actually something that we can bring home and start with in our very own parliament because one of the issues are that of women MPs who go off and have babies and, you know, how do they return to the workplace worrying about the young child at home and also the fact that many women have to travel distances to get to and from their place of work. So I support the idea and I know that there are cost constraints, but it is a key aspect to addressing the gap and, and reducing that masculinity of parliament, but actually making it a place that is amenable to all. So that's my input, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Fernandez. Much appreciated. We just need to be um, mindful of time. I think the entire session um, should be concluded at 12.45. So we also just need to um, compile our report and uh, resolutions accordingly. Honourable Wenger. Thank you, Honourable Philander. Um, sorry, I, I, um, I spoke very um, sort of high level and, um, you know, on the surface for these proposals that obviously, you know, have quite a lot more behind them. But just to expand um, on the proposal to reform the marriage regime and in light of the comments by uh, Mr. Manus, um, you know, the default marriage regime is that of community of property but of course the only options aren't in or out of community of property there are fair um, marriage regimes such as the accrual system which um, then allows for spouses if they um, separate to share equally any um, wealth that was accumulated during their marriage the problem with it is that it requires a uh, legal assistance and fees for lodging, um, the anti-nuptial contracts and so on, which are all things that are then barriers to access a fairer marriage regime. And so what I'm proposing is that we look at what these marriage regimes are and how they disproportionately affect women and make the necessary legal changes so that we can um, have a system in which women can make independent financial choices in spite of how they get married and also still have access to a fair way in which um assets are divided in the case in the case of divorce so um you know we obviously don't have all the answers now but it's certainly something that can be done in the in the in the shorter term with the requisite amounts of research and canvassing thank you thank you very much um honorable wenger um i just need to make sure samir can you kind of just indicate um the time that we still have to our disposal. Good. Hi, Angel Fernando. We have until 12.45. 12.45. Yeah. To conclude with um, deliberations as well as resolutions. Yes, we're going to be pulled back into the main um, session at 12.45. Thank you so much. Um, can I at this point, uh, Ms. Miller? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you have been scribing for us. Um, are you flagging um, the proposed resolutions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Quite a bit, but yes. <laughs> We appreciate. Thank yes, you. I so think we need to get to the third point. Because we're sort of speaking all over. Do you want me to go over the things? Um, are you putting it on the screen for us or are you just um, speaking to it? I I can just speak to it and then we haven't really done it in three points. Everyone just spoke everywhere. So I'm just going to put down what I have now and then we can just see the extent of the gender pay gap and the impact on women. Top level of the wage distribution continue to widen. Characteristic and culture of the corporate sector is dominantly male and white. 
masculine persona and character, very high turnaround times, example in the legal profession, inadvertently excluded, does not see personal responsibility. If anything is wrong, please let me know so I can just fix. I try to type as fast as I could. Then the one lady said to that, having a hot stop, no longer allowed to send emails after hours or stop at a certain time. Invisible barriers that increase the wage gap between women are less likely. What restricts women access to the labor market? They are disproportionately burdened with family responsibilities. Stereotypes that cause inequality for women. Opening the workspace for flexi time and flexi space. Then we set the NCOP for South Africa to amend its marriage regime because women had it difficult to get credit. Our assets are divided when women get divorced. Creation working mom child care grant. Women that earn less than a certain amount should get then a child grant. Improve financial literacy, cheap and easy banking platforms, digital plat banking platforms was to that one. Sectors of the economy do we still experience at the sectors of the economy still experience a pay gap between the public sector and the private sector. Type of interventions and policies to be implemented. That was the member that said we have to see the gap between the public sector and the private sector. How we as the CWP can assist to do research and make an impact in terms of the pay gap. Level of toxic masculinity. Is there anything? Is that what you have scrapped, Ms. Bella? Yes, and I, I still got more. Okay. And then I've got consider a yearly focus or monitor the EE report, extend gender pay gap is shifting or not. That's what I have to consider. And then there was the resolution for the department of trade and industry to engage with private and professional bodies. They must commit as part of a transformation of the gender pay gap. Uh, that is as much as I got. And then I got some stuff at how to address the pay gap, as how to influence, how we can influence policies and how we can address it. Look at equity plans, monitoring and evaluating. Focus on care ECD facilities on the board for the board of the members like women expressing milk. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Miller. Um, I wonder now, we have got exactly six minutes. We've got it extended three minutes uh, before we need to return to the main session. Um, I was now wondering whether it's possible for us to have the three focus or the main parts, whether we could perhaps have that on screen. Um, and I think one would then, I counted nine resolutions. Um, participants can just kindly um, also assist me in that regard. And um, thank you. I note that you ex extended more on the input of the participants. But in terms of the resolutions that was provided, I counted nine. Okay. If we can then. Um, perhaps just slot those uh, resolutions into those um, three parts. Will that be possible? Yes, ma'am. Let me just get it for you. Can Is it possible to do it on screen and then uh, participants can also just um, rectify? We need it. Okay, I just want to share the screen quickly. Thank you, Philander. We do have a little bit of more time, and also because I think until 12:48, and because we're the main group, um, people are going to walk, come back into our group. So we'll see them when they join up. Until 12:48.
Are you managing, Ms. Muller? Yes, I'm just trying to get it to open to share. It's not sure. Just let me know when you can see it, because I'm saying sharing, but I don't think it's opening up. Can you see I'm it on your sure. side? Um, no, unfortunately not. Um, uh, I'm not okay. sure. We... Okay, I'm going to see if I can email it to you then, and then you can maybe oh. open from your side. Yes, not a speaker. Um, is it sent? Yes, ma'am. I was checking on my side, nothing yet. Okay. Um, we've just been reminded we only, we only have two minutes left, so I don't think we'll be able to to do the slotting into those three, which I just see the email now. No, technology. Um, participants in, can we then just uh, conclude um, for the sake of time now on our um, resolutions? Um, the one that was made or the nine that I have captured very roughly um, was um, in terms of the flexi time um, and the space, also the um, amended marriage marriage regime, and was then further elaborated on by Honourable Wenger. Um, the third one was um, the working mum child grant. The fourth one was um, improving financial literacy. Um, we spoke to hot the hot stop um, issue in terms of corporate. And then there was an annual focus um, on the employment equity report, this, the shift in change and the progress being able to be monitored um, accordingly. And uh, there was also a proposal by Honorable Nkontlo in terms of um, the National Department of Women, Labor, Trade and Industry and the private sector and how um, professional bodies can advocate and uh, promote proposals. Um, Ms. Parker spoke to um, how corporate can assist in providing those spaces um, as creches and then how Ms. Member Barnes in terms of policies in general, creating those systems to monitor and evaluate. Um, can we conclude on those nine participants? Or is there any suggestion from your side? Honorable Wenger, I see you. I'm just giving you a thumbs up, Chair. Thank you. Are we happy that we then um, put this forward as the gender pay gap proposals? You comfortable, Chair? 
Thank you very much, everyone. I do get an indication now it's time for us uh, to return to the main session. Thank you so much for your participation and um, for your valuable input. Samir, will we be automatically? Can I get confirmation that everyone's been returned? Um, if one of the um, IT can just let me know before I start. Um, yes, deputy. yes, deputy. OK, thank you very much. Uh, welcome back, everybody. And thank you for the work that you've done in those breakaway sessions. Um, I'd like to introduce Honorable Lorraine Water, who is now going to chair the report back session. Honourable Berta has been a member of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament since 2014 and is doing some amazing work and I welcome her here to take the, the stage. Thank you, Honourable Berta. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And I think that our thread throughout this programme today has been that we as women have to become the ladders for others of us to climb and to excel and not for us to become obstacles so that we can fall. I think that is the message that I get out of today. We have to be united in the differences that we pose to each other, but also to draw strength from one another. So I think that is the theme. And then with that said, Deputy Speaker, I am sure that our breakaway groups has had a good, robust engagement on the topics that we um, have embarked upon. So there will be three groups that are um, giving us feedback. And without any further ado, Deputy Speaker, I will now call upon the first group who has discussed the gender remuneration gap and that feedback will be done by the chairperson of who hosted that group and she is Honourable Wendy Philander. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, um, Honourable um, Bota. It was indeed a very robust and um, interesting um, discussion. Um, we unfortunately, due to time, um, did not have the opportunity to slot our recommendations into the three main categories, um, which was um, the extent of the gender pay gap and the impact on women, um, the main contributing factors um, to the gender pay gap, as well as how to address um, the gender pay gap, but it was addressed in the various uh, resolutions. So what uh, participants um, um, deliberated on and um, discussed um, and what was then concluded on um, by group one was the following um, that we create um, the space and and flexi time um, in order for women um, to to be able to to flourish within the um, um, environment um, I'm sorry, we also had an issue with um, transferring our scribe notes. Our, our scribe was very sharp, but in transferring those notes. So what I have in front of me is rough notes that I make, but we will obviously after this um, formalize um, what we have, the both of us. So um, that was the first one. The second one was in terms of um, proposing amendments um, pertaining to the marriage um, regimes. Um, to the NCOP, um, and um, thirdly, how the working mum, or rather the child care grant for working mums, as, um, yes, that was the third one, and then fourthly, improve the financial um, literacy of women, 
Um, overall, the fifth one that was agreed upon and that is um, was mainly um, focused on um, in the corporate sector as to uh, what was referred to um, as a hard, hard stop. Um, Chair, there was also a sixth um, proposal and that was that there be an annual um, focus on the employment equity report and one could then um, from that report um, see whether there was a shift or a change and also monitor progress in terms of women um, empowerment accordingly. And then there was also a proposal made, the seventh one was to um, include the National Department of Women, the Labour Department, as well as the Department of Trade and Industry and private sector and other bodies as to advocating and um, promoting this proposals that was put forward. Um, Chairperson, also as an eighth resolution, um, it was proposed for co corporate to create um, the space and the facility uh, within the various working areas where it would be able to for creches to be um, established. And the final one was then um, for just quickly see um, what exactly um, is policy saying was the member at the time said what she gathered from the research um, documents was not too clear um, for her uh, in terms of policies that guides us um, to make sure that we monitor and would be able to evaluate um, as such as was mentioned in terms of employment equity as well. Chairperson, as I said, that is my rough notes, but um, this what the scribe um, and what I have, we will um, correlate as well, and that will be a more formal um, presentation, um, obviously. But yes, that is what Group 1 has resolved during this session. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair Philander. Well, within your time, you were allocated 10 minutes. And I'm just saying to the other two groups, there are 10 minutes for you to give your feedback. Yes, you say it's been your rough notes, but it did not come across rough at all. So thank you uh, very much, um, Wendy. Um, then, um, audience, our second group is the group who has discussed gender responsive budgeting and the chair for that group who facilitated there was Deirdre Bartman and I welcome you Deirdre for your 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much chairperson. Um, in our particular um, session some of the resolutions that came forth included um, firstly, apologies. I would like to thank the, the colleagues in gender responsive budgeting. It was quite robust and, and quite a number of resolutions that came up as responsibilities for this topic. The first one is data disaggregation within reporting of gender responsive budgeting, that this relates to ensuring that data is disaggregated in programs and indicators and includes um, monitoring impact and outcomes in reporting and that in jurisdictions where there's no framework for gender responsive budgeting and how monitoring and evaluation is done, that these frameworks be developed by the respective treasuries. The second one um, paired with this particular resolution is that there needs to be a comprehensive integrated IT systems within our respective jurisdictions in, in order for data collection um, and in order for us to use that data on women in our gender responsive budgeting. Yeah. And this must include artificial intelligence, machine based learning, blockchain technology, and must be paired with cyber security um, in those particular um, matters. And then we requested that there be training and capacity development of women, and this be a priority in gender responsive budgeting within our treasuries and departments. Further, that um, 
when it comes to incentivizing keeping girls in education, keeping women in education, keeping women in employment, that they be comprehensive tax incentives, whether this falls within general taxes, in specific taxes and or grants, that there be comprehensive taxes, um, uh, incentives for this. Um, and this be uh, this relates to uh, tax institutions and respective treasuries. Then further, our frontline services uh, in terms of, for example, health care workers and social care workers must be prioritized in our budgeting and that there needs to be um, provision for wellness, uh, provision for debriefing, provision for funding for, for them in our respective budgets and where there are volunteers that we work towards um, stipends in this regard and specifically when it comes to social workers that our respective social departments partner with the education system to either partner social workers with with schools in the clusters or particular schools and that the social development departments in jurisdictions also partner with tertiary education in order to place graduates of social workers and in order to incentivize the funding of social workers in our tertiary education this could possibly be done through um, providing a tax incentive such as um, a subsidy to universities in order to ensure that um, social workers uh, get uh, uh, students get funded and placed further that there is provision of free sanitary towels for girls and funding for that within public uh, institutions such as police stations, schools, hospitals, clinics, and where um, one buys sanitary towels that um, matters such as value added tax not be added to sanitary towels. We did make note that not all jurisdictions call it value added tax, so it can assist us with a more generalized term if, if possible. Um, that they um, be funding for substance abuse and appropriate treatment um, for women and this be prioritized, that there's funding uh, available for economic development um, in order to support young entrepreneurs who are females in starting their own businesses and assisting with startup funding, um, including mentoring and coaches, so that women do not only need to rely on grant funding, that um, we um, encourage and lobby for the implementation of a working mom's childcare grant where women who are employed are able to receive funding to make sure that their children are in ECD. And this can go paired with the previous resolution regarding comprehensive tax systems and this would then encourage women not only to remain in employment but also for the children uh, especially girl children to remain in education and that this particular type of incentive must be higher than the current unemployment grants and incentives so that it encourage people to find work um, that there is uh, basic income support for women as basic carers, and this also goes paired with a comprehensive tax system for women, um, that departments must partner with NGOs and MPOs and ensure that where they do not meet criteria for receiving funding related to women and implementation thereof, that the departments capacitate uh, that particular sector in order to for them to understand what the criteria is to, to, to qualify for funding, that that um, we, we thought about um, the other group, which is STEM, and we said to ourselves that STEM will not be able to implement their priorities if there's no funding for it, and we must make sure that in our gender responsive uh, budgeting that funding is put forward um, for STEM. Uh, and that in terms of the private sector that and this is similar to the tax incentives that must be provided that private companies um, must be uh, indicated that if they use the United Nations uh, sustainable development goals uh, to report contributions on females and empowerment of females and women that they make, that they do so to tax institutions and that they then be incorporated in that uh, comprehensive tax and, and financial type of system so that the private sector is incentivized to employ women and for women to remain employed. I apologize, Chair, I do not know if I've missed any of the particular um, resolutions, but um, if there are any, I encourage my colleagues to, to assist me in, in, in any corrections in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member uh, Bartman. 
our and you were also well within your allocated time so thank you for managing that and then our third and final group who will um, report back is the group that discussed enrollment of women in stem and stem is science technology engineering and mathematics uh, programs and that uh, feedback will be done by the chairperson Ntombe Zanele Gladys Baku Baku Force. Uh, Member Baku Baku Force, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, our recommendations, Chair, is as follows. In the enrollment of women in STEM-related un university programs, the recommendation is any mentorship program required to encourage girls to take up the career choices, choice of STEM programs. Women graduates and women who have taken up this career of choice to be part of this mentorship program. And the organizations such as Technovation present to girls in secondary school on STEM and WCPP researchers should search for other organizations who offer similar. And the bursary scheme to be offered to girls for special maths classes. Learners encouraged at grade eight and nine level already to consider STEM as career. More research on barriers that prevent girls from entering STEM faculties and how metric results are presented should be reconsidered. Addressing reasons that, that girls consider maths literacy that, rather than pure maths drive government policies to accept STEM as a career and reduce fees for women who consider STEM as a career. That would be our recommendations, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much. Uh, Member Baku Baku Force, can you please switch off your uh, video camera now? Thank you. Um, Deputy Speaker and audience, that takes care of the recommendations that came out of all three groups, all three breakaway groups. And um, Deputy Speaker, if you would allow me, um, I want to ask that um, these um, recommendations that came out of this, that it is taken further into a discussion in, in, in the next CWP session so that we can flesh out all the recommendations and so that we could put timelines to these recommendations, but also that we can uh, put together a clear contract of how we action these recommendations um, so that we don't get together next year, God willing, and we have similar discussions and we have not had action steps. And I think that you would allow me that liberty to say that in this um, forum. So I want to thank everybody, especially the chairs who facilitated the sessions, but also our staff who was brilliant in supporting us in the breakaway sessions. And thank you for giving me the opportunity of giving the, um, uh, of facilitating the feedback of that session. So thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Boerter. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, it is always such an important part to be able to bring together um, these three very, very important challenges uh, that women find themselves right across the planet. And, uh, it, you know, I really do want to, uh, to, to thank you for, for coordinating that. Finally, um, Honourable Members, to everybody, our guests, our international guests, a really, really big thank you to each one of you, to our guest speakers here today, and to our members who did the votes of thanks, who contributed to the success of this online virtual platform. 
I believe that as a sub-branch of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, we certainly could partner with more of our branches across the continent to support and hold the space for the empowerment of women. And, and so I'd, I'd like to take up what Honorable Gimba has, has offered to us and look at this um, during the course of 2022. Because I strongly believe that united we stand, divided we fall. And uh, we often forget that we feel safe when we are supported. So that would certainly be one of the um, opportunities that I would like to drive uh, for us uh, to participate in next year. To the chairs of the breakaway session and for you, Honorable Boer, to thank you for the work and just getting to the crux of the issues, being able to sift through the conversation. I look forward to that final report that we can actually use and take to the people and to our stakeholders across in the Western Cape. But very, very important, and Honorable Boerter touched on this, was this event could not have taken place without the many people behind the scenes that had to meticulously rehearse each and every step. And, you know, I came in and out of these weekly meetings that we had. This was a stretch goal. It was never done before. And I'd really like to thank each and every IT staff member under the management of Mr. Scricker that led this virtual platform in such a seamless way. I know that they had to look for the technology and they had to test the technology because I wanted them to ensure that each breakaway session could be live streamed at the same time. So thank you very much for stepping up to the plate. Uh, we constantly um, are improving and achieving our goals and becoming that, that virtual parliament that makes it possible for us to communicate across borders, no matter where we are. To all the administrative staff um, under the banner of and the management of Sunel for sure, thank you very much for making this happen and to the speaker for giving us the opportunity to be able to host this yeah, very, very important event. To my colleagues, across the provinces who were who took the time out. Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate your participation in events like this, and we would very much like to work closer with you in future virtual events. Honourable members, guests, ladies and gentlemen, to the Premier popped in to our ministers, once again, a very big thank you. I look forward to next week's debate and look forward to taking these resolutions, as I say, into the Western Cape. Um, thank you very much for your Friday. May you have a wonderful weekend. Be safe, wear a mask, and this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.